hope you guys enjoyed that little video there showing Ric Flair playing Yahtzee. This is your AEW Dynamite review for Wednesday, October 4th, 2023. Tonight was the four-year anniversary episode of Dynamite. Can you believe we've been doing these reviews for four years now? It's been a while. It doesn't feel like that long, but four years of Dynamite punctuated tonight by one of the biggest WWE names of all time. Adam Copeland making his Dynamite debut after his uh, first debut at Wrestle Dream on Sunday. He closed out the show tonight talking to the fans, talking to the AEW locker room and all the people he wants to step into the ring with, but also talking to his best friend Christian Cage, who he invited down to the ring. And Christian Cage did not have uh, kind words for his best friend. In what was overall, I thought, a good episode of Dynamite. Uh, but obviously, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, not only Copeland, but what happened at the end of the show, where they could be going from here. It's still very weird. It's only been his second appearance so far. But it's still very weird for me to actually see him in an AEW ring. Because if you would have asked me the question a month ago, do I think that Edge is going to actually go to AEW and leave WWE after all these years? I would have said no, and I did say no at the time. When push came to shove, I didn't think he would actually make the move. But then I saw him at the scrum the other night. When I wrapped up the review and I went back and I watched the 15 minutes that he spent at that media scrum after the show was over, talking to the people in the room, answering questions about why he came to AEW. And he looked like a little kid. He really did. He he looked like a little kid who was so happy to be there. He looked reinvigorated. Like he was so excited. He couldn't wait to get into the ring with all these new opponents. And he was just genuinely excited to be there. And there is just something very cool about being able to see somebody who has been doing this for so long. He's been doing this over 30 years. And he can still be that excited to go to work and do what he does. Which is why, again, a lot of the hatred and a lot of the comments that I've seen directed at him, it just makes me laugh. Because this is a guy who clearly doesn't care about any of that. He tunes all that noise out, and he's happy. He's happy being in AEW. He's happy being able to contribute now. And it, for him, it's a new challenge. You know, one chapter ends, another one begins. One book closes, another one opens. And this is going to be a lot of fun, uh, following along to see exactly what he does and how different it is from what he was doing in WWE, being that he's going to be a full-time guy. Uh, we didn't know that at the end of the pay-per-view on Sunday, but he made that very clear. He and Tony Khan both, they made that very clear that Copeland is going to be on television every week. He'll be on Collision this Saturday, and he'll be on Dynamite making his in-ring debut next week against Luchasaurus, and we're going to be seeing a lot of him on TV. Do they overexpose him? Does it get to a point where... There's a little too much Adam Copeland on TV, and it no longer feels special. That's going to be up to Tony Khan to figure out the balance. What is the best way to use him on TV? He found that balance with Sting. He's done very well in the past when it comes to these legends who come in to work for him. And so I don't think it'll be any different with Copeland, but I am looking forward already to seeing the eventual Edge and Christian battle, especially after that closing angle tonight, where they even teased that Edge wanted to team with Christian. He came back because he wants to prove to the world that they are inarguably one of the greatest tag teams of all time. And uh, Christian had a, a very succinct response to that. So even the idea of Edge and Christian partnering up again, you know it's something that will absolutely happen in AEW, but they're going to make you wait for it. That's not going to happen for a long time. So there's a lot of things they could be doing with those two. But we also had the AEW World Champion on the show tonight. And I will say that the AEW World Champion feels like a secondary character on this show. As, as over as he is and as great as the work is that MJF is putting out on the microphone, in the ring, he really does feel like a secondary character on the show. And he had a segment in the middle of the show uh, involving Bullet Club Gold, who left him laying. And the challenge was issued by Jay White, and it is now official. At Full Gear, November 18th, it will be Switchblade Jay White challenging for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. 
against MJF, and that is going to be a fantastic match. Hopefully the show closing match. It'll be nice to have the champion actually in the main event after having back-to-back pay-per-views of him curtain jerking. Uh, but that match was made official a lot earlier than I thought it would be. We still have a ways to go until we get to full gear, but at least now we have our main event. We also have a new member of the Don Callis family in Powerhouse Hobbs. I'm going to have some thoughts on that. This is not the first family that Powerhouse Hobbs has been a part of. It didn't really work out the first two times. I'm hoping it works out better for him here the third time. Third time's a charm. And we have the return of Wardlow, who many people may have forgotten even still works for the company. But yes, Wardlow is back. And they're going to try again with Wardlow. We haven't seen him since June. So that was a nice surprise to see him back on the television show tonight. But the other story is, next week, Dynamite is not airing in its normal time slot. Dynamite next week will be airing on Tuesday. So effectively, we have a a Super Tuesday coming up next week, where Dynamite is going to be going head-to-head with NXT. Tuesday, of course, is NXT's normal night. WWE is not taking this lying down. I want to know where all these people are, by the way, who are still convinced that WWE, whenever they say that, oh, we don't consider AEW to be competition, right? All television is our competition, which, of course, it is. But all the people who who still believe, honestly, that AEW is not competition, or WWE does not view them as competition, where are those people? Those people have gone awfully silent. They're loading up. John Cena is on NXT next week. Cody Rhodes is on NXT next week. Asuka's on NXT, Becky Lynch is on NXT, Paul Heyman is on NXT. You're going to tell me they don't view AEW as competition? You're delusional. For the fans, though, I'm looking forward to it next week. As a content creator who who wants to try to watch both shows, it's going to be a pain in the ass. Uh, But I'm actually looking forward to next week. I think that's going to be a lot of fun, Uh, even even though uh, you have people who are melting down over this whole situation. But we did get a little more insight tonight about what AEW has planned, including this match right here. This is one of the ways that Tony Khan is going to be competing next week with NXT. Swerve Strickland and Brian Danielson, first time ever, are going to go one-on-one next week in a number one contenders match. The winner will challenge Christian Cage, possibly at full gear. I don't know. They didn't say. But at a future date, for the TNT Championship. That is going to be an outstanding match. And that is one of many that AEW has planned for next week. So again, competition is a great thing for the talent. Competition is a great thing, though, also for the fans. And that's what we're getting a, a glimpse of next week. But this is your AEW Dynamite review, as I mentioned, for October 4, 2023. I am the Solomon Monster. Why is Solomonster a punk hater? Why does he hate punk so much? What did he ever do to him? Uh, uh. Hey, Brian Becerra coming in early with a $40 Super Chat. Thank you, Brian. Yes, indeed, Super Chats are open, as you can see. Get them on in. I will be reading them here on the air. What do you think of this whole Tuesday night skirmish next week? Chime in, let me know. Hit that like button as well. 400 likes is the goal tonight for our Be The Booker segment. Of course, as always, channel memberships are open if you would like to become a channel member. G-W-O. We sure would like to have you as part of our little green world order, so you can go ahead and instead of joining, forget the Don Callis family, you can join the Sala Monster family here on the channel. Our door is always open to you, no matter what. So Dynamite opened tonight with Renee in the back, a little bit of a different opening where they just went to an interview with Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega backstage. This was ahead of their tag team match. They had a match scheduled tonight against Kanosuke Takeshita and Sammy Guevara. And she noted that they were on opposing sides four years ago on the debut episode of Dynamite, and here tonight they're tag team partners. So all of a sudden, Adam Copeland walks into the picture. So much for saving him for the very end of the show. They just trotted him out here in the opening segment. And he said that, uh, hey, there should be maple syrup with all the Canadians on set. Because you had Renee, you had him, you had Jericho, you had Omega. 
It was a whole big Canadian uh, click they had here. He wished Jericho luck and said that it was always good to see him, and they shook hands. So then Omega stepped up. He told him that it was good to meet him. He told him that he had him on the edge of his seat the other night. You can hear all the fans in the arena laughing at that line. Omega offered his hand. Copeland accepted before telling them to take care of the Callis family because he also does not like Don Callis. Uh, that is not how I expected him to make his Dynamite debut, just randomly popping up here in this backstage segment. It was very cool, though, to see him share the screen with Kenny Omega for the very first time. Uh, that is a match that hopefully we will have a chance to see. That is one of many opponents that Copeland has named as someone he would like to get into the ring with. Uh, and as far as he and Jericho, it, I think it's been about 13 years since we've seen the two of them together on television. Right, probably 2010. They had the WrestleMania match that year. They were feuding. That probably was the last time they shared screen time together because Edge retired in 2011. And when, by the time he came back, Jericho was already in AEW. So it's been a while since we've seen him and Jericho, who have a lot of history together as well. So to the ring, we kick things off formally on tonight's episode with the international championship on the line. It was Ray Phoenix defending his title against Nick Jackson of the Young Bucks, who won a number one contender's three-way last week. Uh, this was their first match on Dynamite since four years ago, the early days of Dynamite. That match was excellent. This match was no different. Phoenix was selling a back injury early on. Penta went over. Alex Abrahantes went over to check on him. And this was the, this was the story that they built uh, into the match. So. At Wrestle Dream, there was some concern, and I wasn't sure either, if he had suffered a legitimate injury in the four-way tag team match because he was in the ring for a minute, and then they took him out, and the medics took him to the back. We never saw him again. So apparently it was just part of the story uh, that they were telling of him being hurt, and he's you know going into this title match this week hurt. And the whole thing just rings hollow to me. Not that it's unbelievable to think that somebody who wrestles the style that Phoenix does would be hurt going into a match, but we just went through the story with Orange Cassidy, who held that same championship a hell of a lot longer than Phoenix has had it, and the story with him was how beaten down and hurt he was, right? Every part of his body was just broken down because he was constantly defending the title every week on TV. So it just feels like they're kind of running through the same story again, only now they're doing it with somebody else. But there was a spot here where Nick connected with a super kick that knocked Phoenix down. Phoenix immediately kicked right back up to his feet, ate another super kick, and then they did a, uh, a spot here where both men who were down kicked up at the same time, kicked each other at the same time, and then we got a double down, and the crowd gave him a standing ovation. They were loving this. Phoenix hit a rolling Hurricane Rana into a pin attempt, and Nick tried to answer with his moonsault off the apron on the outside. He tweaked his ankle. Phoenix tried a rolling cutter, but Nick countered with a cutter of his own. Back inside, Nick spiked him with a slingshot face buster, and he signaled for a BTE trigger, but Phoenix put on the brakes. Both men pulled each other up to the top rope. They were balancing themselves on the top rope. Nick hit a Avalanche cutter for a two count. Nick connected on a running knee strike and a BTE trigger to the back of the head, but Phoenix again kicked out. Phoenix came back with a double stop and a frog splash for two, and Nick then countered the fire thunder driver into a roll up. Phoenix countered into a pin, and he got the three count to retain the title. So this was a fast paced back and forth match between these two here uh, to give the show a hot start, like an old Nitro. We started out hot, and this is exactly what I expected from these two. Again, the match they had four years ago was great. Uh, this match was very much, uh, I don't want to say which one was better than the other. I haven't seen that match in four years, but uh, this was a very good match. No surprise on the outcome, uh, although I do, I do think, based on what they've announced for next week, that Phoenix's run is going to be a short-lived one. We'll talk about that later. So then we had a bit of a mess. They pitched it to an Adam Cole segment. This was a pre tape vignette. If you remember last week, uh, was it on Collision? It might have been on Collision. 
that Matt Taven looked into the camera and he was begging Adam Cole, please delay your surgery. Roddy needs you. Come to the house. And so, in storyline, Adam Cole still has not had ankle surgery. He has put the surgery off because there was an emergency of some kind and his good friend Roderick Strong needed him, so he went to Roddy's house. So that's where the vignette started. The problem is we couldn't hear anything. The only thing we could hear, the audio from the segment, was playing in the arena. So if you listen really, really close, it sounded like they were underwater. But if you listen really, really close, you might be able to pick up on what they were saying. But if you were watching on TBS, you couldn't hear anything. And this was a two and a half minute segment, and it was like that throughout the entire segment. The whole thing was like this. I, I had to go online just to check to make sure that I wasn't the only one. I thought my audio was messed up. Uh, but anybody watching on TBS had the same issue. So, of course, I'm sitting here thinking here, well, I mean, it wouldn't be an anniversary episode of Dynamite without there being audio issues. Yet again, this is after, by the way, a tweet that Tony Khan put out earlier this afternoon. It was like an alert to all AEW fans, letting them know that there was an error on the part of TBS. There was some sort of error in the system. And he was warning people, check your DVRs, because Dynamite on a lot of systems, I think including uh, DirecTV and I think Sling and Verizon, on a lot of systems, Dynamite today was listed for 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, on YouTube TV, it was said okay, it was, it was fine. But apparently it was like this on a lot of different systems, and that was an error on the TBS end. So Tony Khan was scrambling, trying to let people know, hey, check your DVRs, the show's on at its normal time. Of course, I saw all the memes of Shawn Michaels at the keyboard pushing the key, trying to hack into the system. So the audio issue that we had here in this segment was a TBS issue because I heard from people who were watching on Fight who said that everything played just fine. So yet again, this was a TBS issue. That coupled with the DVR issue earlier in the day, if I didn't know any better, I would almost think that Warner Brothers Discovery is trying to chase these guys away. I mean, what's going on here? Constant issues here with the network. I mean, TBS is a major basic cable network. I don't understand why they constantly have problems like this. Sometimes the audio issues can be an AEW thing. Sometimes they're on the TBS end. I don't understand what's so hard to fix this. I don't know why there have to be constant issues like this. Tony Khan, he went on Twitter here. Once he realized what was going on, Tony Khan went on Twitter. And you can tell he was angry because he started the tweet. He said, due to repeated audio issues on TBS. That's how he started the tweet. So you know he was pissed off to start things out like that. Due to repeated audio issues on TBS, I understand our fans missed the Adam Cole segment. I've requested an overrun tonight so that we can replay the Cole Roddy King, uh, Kingdom video on TBS with the audio intact on tonight's Dynamite. So that is why we got a little bit of a late start here because Dynamite actually got a rare overrun tonight and not by a minute or two. They went about seven or eight minutes overtime because Tony Khan probably picked up the phone and he was probably just demanding like, all right, look, you guys messed up here. You need to give us extra time. Otherwise, you know that women's match was going to be cut. That would be the first thing cut from the show. So clearly, Tony Khan was not very happy about what happened. And you know what? He should be upset because this is a repeated issue here. It's embarrassing. It's like Mickey Mouse. It doesn't make sense. Does TBS have audio issues like this when they're airing baseball games? Why is it constantly with the AEW shows? Doesn't seem to be affecting any other network that airs this show. So I don't understand what the issue is, but he needs to have a long conversation with them and figure out a solution to this because it's embarrassing. So they did replay the segment. A couple segments later, they did replay it for the people who couldn't hear it. And basically what it was, it was a comedy segment. They aired a shot of Cole, who of course was on his crutches, and he still has the big cast on his foot, on his leg. And he was standing outside of Roddy's house. The door swings open, and there's Roddy. He's in his wheelchair. He's got the neck brace on. He's screaming at him. He's in his hospital gown still, and he invites uh, Cole inside. Matt Taven and Mike Bennett are there as well. And Roddy presents Cole with a gift, and he, he takes the blanket off, and it's a scooter. 
that he bought specifically for Adam so that he can rest his, his knee on it because he's got the bad leg. And Cole was all excited, so then they play some cheesy pop music uh, as they show the two of them kind of in slow motion riding like he was in the wheelchair, Cole was on the scooter, and they're riding it around the house, and they're having fun like a couple of kids. And they showed at one point uh, Taven, who was heading a stuffed draft, and he had a, a look on his face like he was jealous. So then Roddy asked Cole if he could help him move some furniture, which, of course, Cole says, you know, move furniture. I got a, I got a broken ankle here. So then they show Cole moving furniture as uh, Strong watches on. Roddy said that he loved what Cole did with the place. He goes, it's unique, just like his friend Adam. Cole said he had to leave now to go have surgery. Roddy said, look, you don't, you can't leave yet. I still need your help. And that was the entire segment. It was a little bit funnier than it sounds here on paper, but probably not worth replaying twice on the same show, but at least the second time I could actually hear what they were saying. So now that I'm looking at this, right, it, I thought it was a little suspect on Collision when they first said, hey, hey, Cole, delay your surgery, right? We need you. Delay your surgery. And we see this segment here. Now, we don't know when this segment was filmed. This is either a situation where Cole already had his surgery, which is why he has that on his leg. And he's well enough to, to move around and not be, you know, bedridden. But he either already had the surgery. Or it could very well be a case where he's hurt, but not nearly as hurt as they make it out to be on TV. Because it's just weird. Why would he not have his surgery yet? I'm sure he either did, or again, it's a situation where they over-exaggerated the severity of the injury, and he'll be able to come back a lot quicker. That doesn't mean he'll be back soon. But it could be a situation where instead of, oh, he hasn't even had surgery yet, he's going to be gone for six to nine months. Maybe he's back in two or three. So that is a possibility because it definitely feels like there's something going on here, and especially the longer they drag this out for, where Roddy isn't going to let him have the surgery. Then you know something is up. It's got to be one of those two. Yeah, somebody in the chat, Daddy Ugarte says a high ankle sprain. It could very well be. Like, I believe he's hurt, but they could be greatly exaggerating the severity of it. And I hope that's the case, because the quicker we can get him back in the ring, the better. Like I said last week when, when we found out about the injury, you know, broken in three places, it's devastating. Now, they can pivot, which they've already done, because they're doing MJF and Jay White. So they'll figure out a backup plan to this. But he's part of the biggest story going right now in this company. So to lose him for six months plus would be devastating to whatever plans Tony Khan already had the sooner they can get him back, the better. And if they can at least do segments with him on television like this, it's better than not having him on television at all. It's, it's similar to what WWE is doing with Pretty Deadly, right? I mean, and they didn't do a lot with them, but they, they did some segments for comedy with Elton Prince, and he had the separated shoulder. Uh, this is worse because Pretty Deadly is not a main event act. Adam Cole is in this company. But uh, yeah, something's a little... A little sus with this whole Adam Cole situation. So then we come back live to the ring. Griff Garrison is in the ring. Griff Garrison, poor, poor Griff, has lost his tag team partner. No more Brian Pillman Jr. He's about to make his NXT debut. They're already airing vignettes for him on TV. So Griff Garrison's by himself in the ring. And you know, this whoever's coming out, this is not going to end well for him. And Justin Roberts introduces Wardlow. So it's like a lamb being led to slaughter here. This was Wardlow's first match since he lost the TNT Championship. I guess that would have been, what, the third time? He lost the TNT title to Luchasaurus in June. He has not been seen since. And I think what happened was when his car was legitimately broken into earlier in the year and they turned it into an angle, his passport was stolen. And I believe that was the problem, is that he didn't have a valid passport it just so happened that AEW was going on their first Canadian tour. They were in Canada for like three or four weeks. And then they were building to a big show in London. So if he still has no passport, he can't go to London. It was just a, a bad streak of luck 
for Wardlow. But it's more than just bad luck. It's been bad luck. It's been bad booking. Tony Khan has completely mishandled Wardlow. And I, I'm sure there were times where injuries played a role or the passport issue played a role. But that does not excuse the booking of Wardlow over the past 15, 16 months. I mean, he has dropped the ball with somebody that should have been a surefire thing. And now I see him coming out to the ring tonight on this show. And he looks, not that he looks like a defeated man, but I'm looking at him. And he, he looked different. It looked like maybe he didn't tan. You know, these guys like to, they like to come out looking bronze when they come out on TV. Uh, so it just, it, it didn't look the same way that we remember him being the last time we saw him on TV. But he's got this pissed off look on his face. He marches down to the ring with a purpose. He mows down Griff right away in the corner with shoulders to the midsection, boots in the corner. We got a powerbomb symphony, although at no point during this did he play to the crowd. This was not like Wardlow out there going like this and soaking in the cheers. Like, he was all business. Five power bombs later, Paul Turner put an end to it. We got the ref stoppage. Wardlow left the ring through the crowd. Didn't say anything, didn't interact with the fans. He just walked through the crowd and immediately went to the back. It is good to see Wardlow back, number one. He was not interacting with the fans. He was not doing anything that would lead you to believe he's going to be a heel or a babyface. Everybody was cheering for him like he was a babyface. I don't know what he's going to be. And frankly, I don't care. The most important thing is to get this guy back on TV, and now they've got to start all over again. They have to build him back up. They have to find a story for him. It is kind of funny, though. You know, I just was talking about Wardlow last week, floating an idea where, you know, you could potentially do something with him and MJF as a way to reintroduce him to TV if Adam Cole is going to be gone for a while. And then the very next week, look who's back on TV. It's Wardlow. Although there was no indication they're doing anything with him and MJF. So whatever idea Tony Khan has, I hope that this time he'll be on television consistently and he'll find something for him to do. And hopefully he can get himself back up to that level that he was at before. Because ever since he broke away from MJF and he beat him in Vegas at double or nothing last year, it has been a steep decline for this guy. This is this is a guy who people, myself included, were talking about as a potential, you know, world championship contender by this year, by the middle of this year. With MJF winning the title, like, how do you not do MJF and Wardlow? How do you not circle back to that, considering Wardlow obliterated this guy last year? And now here we are almost a year and a half later, and it's like, no, he he's nowhere close to even being in that position. There's so many people now who are ahead of him. And it never should have been that way. So Tony Khan has to start all over with him now, and I hope that it works out because it would be a real shame if whenever his contract comes due, he decides he's not happy, he's going to leave. We've seen Cody leave. Jade Cargill left. She just signed with WWE. They rolled the red carpet out for her. Wardlow's another guy on the list. Wardlow, Ricky Starks. There are certain people I can see being next in line to make that jump when the time is right to go to WWE. And honestly, if you're Wardlow, who could blame the guy? Can you really blame him? If when his contract came due, he said, you know what? I'm going to go try my hand somewhere else. You don't think WWE wouldn't want to snatch him up? He's still young. He's still pretty young talks well, he can work, he can do things in the ring that are very impressive for a guy his size. He has all the tools to be a big-time player. They just haven't been able to put it together with him. If Tony Khan doesn't do it, I'm sure WWE would love to have the chance. So this may be Tony's last chance to do something meaningful with this guy before he just completely mentally checks out. Now, Renee was backstage. This was a segment filmed earlier tonight. She was in the back with Don Callis and Kanosuke Takeshita. And Callis said that Sammy Guevara was deemed medically unfit to compete tonight. And so therefore, he would have to find somebody else to tag with Takeshita later on in the show. And he found another young star, someone who was recommended by Will Ospreay, 
And that person is Kyle Fletcher from Osseo. Kyle Fletcher has no tag team partner at the moment. Mark Davis, he got hurt at Wrestle Dream. Clearly, he looked like he broke his wrist. Uh, I don't know if they said broken wrist. I know later on they acknowledged on commentary that Davis was hurt. He's got a broken wrist. So he's going to be out for a while. And at least they found something for Kyle Fletcher to do here on this show. The acclaimed and Billy Gunn against The Butcher, The Blade, and Kip Sabian for the trio's titles. I don't know why this was on the show tonight. This did not need to be on Dynamite. This could have been on Rampage or Collision. But they put it here on Dynamite. Max Caster, he was isolated through a commercial break before Bowens made the hot tag when they came back. Bowens hit Scissor Me Timbers on Blade, and Bowens and Caster hit their over-the-top slam on Sabian to pick up the win. Not much else to say about this. This was very, you know, pedestrian stuff here. It was a way to give the champions something to do on the show. It was a way to get them onto the show. So that's what they uh, came up with here. It was so important that Excalibur spent the closing moments of this match hyping up matches for next week's show. So there you go. Uh, I hope they can get these three guys better competition than what we saw tonight. We got the final installment of Tony Storm, Portrait of a Star. They've been doing this series of vignettes with RJ City, who's been interviewing Tony. She's like the damsel in distress or the, uh, the washed up uh, old timey Hollywood star. She's lost her mind. And she was telling him that he doesn't know what it's like to live in the spotlight, it's something everyone tries to take away from you. She said that she sits awake at night wondering if she still has it. And then RJ broke the news to her. You're not that old. What are you talking about that you don't have it? How old is Tony Storm, by the way? Is she even in her 30s? I'm not even sure if she's 30 yet. She is still very young. So at that point, when he mentions that, she has this epiphany that she's timeless. And she stands up, and she's just kind of looking around, and she starts yelling over and over again. She's repeating, I'm timeless, I'm timeless. So now she's timeless Tony Storm. This was completely ridiculous, and I loved every second of it. I don't know. I, I just, I'm digging this character. She's completely lost her mind. She's completely delusional. She lost her championship, and she lost her marbles. It's not hard to understand. Again, there, there was a time once before, even the greatest among us, Okada, he lost his title. He was walking around with balloons. The balloons became the thing that he clinged to the most. It happens to the best of us. You should see some of the tweets and the emails that I have to put up with on a regular basis. It's amazing that I'm not sitting here losing my mind here on these streams. It's amazing that I don't have a balloon sitting next to me when I do these streams. Any one of us can lose our minds at any given moment. It just so happens to be Tony Storm. She's 27. Okay, so Tony Storm, apparently she turns 28 this month. Wow, we share a birthday month. I didn't know that. So she turns 28 on October 19th. Juice Robinson, Mrs. Tony Storm, and the Guns, representing Bullet Club Gold, they made their way to the ring after they showed footage from the very end of Dynamite last week, that cliffhanger, uh, where Jay White was being beaten up by these mystery men in black, and we had that one man in the MJF devil mask. Austin Gunn said that it was story time with the Bang Bang Gang, and they ran down MJF's promo from last week against Jay White saying that the reason MJF jumped Switchblade at the end of the show was because he was scared. And Robinson demanded that MJF come down to the ring to confront them. MJF came out on stage, and he called Juice talentless taint. And Juice said that he had a rock-hard taint. And this is why I don't tell people who know me, family, friends, is why I don't tell them how I spend my Wednesday nights. Because I don't want them to tune in and see me sitting here talking about another man, talking about his taint. So I keep it a secret. As far as anybody knows, I'm watching television right now, getting ready for bed, just like any other normal person. This is why. 
So, MJF started rattling off a list of all the horrible things that he has done in his AEW career, including throwing Chris Jericho off the top of a cage, whipping Cody Rhodes with his belt, injuring kids during a game of dodgeball, and calling his boss an effing mark on TV. He said again that he wasn't the one who attacked Tofu Jay White last week, and he challenged Bullet Club Gold to a Stockton street fight tonight. He hit the ring, the heels bailed, just long enough for Jay White to appear behind MJF, and then he laid him out with a Blade Runner. And so Jay White picked up the big Burberry belt, and he left with it. He took the AEW World title with him. When he got to the stage, he turned around, and he had the microphone, and he said that the AEW title on his shoulder felt really nice. He said MJF's cheap tricks won't work with him, and he's not fooling anybody when saying that he wasn't responsible for the attack on him last week. He said, they know the real MJF. He's a dirty, pathetic liar and a slimy, gutless coward. AEW needs an elite champion, something MJF is not. And with that, he issued a challenge. November 18th, at Full Gear, at the Kia Forum, MJF against Jay White for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. And an angry MJF stood up in the ring and he told Tofu that he has two words for him. You're on! So it is official, those two will wrestle for the AEW World title next month at Full Gear. I'm glad they announced this match early. I'm surprised a little bit that they uh, did announce it this early. Uh, but it gives them plenty of time now to build up that, that match. And MJF against Jay White uh, is a strong main event for that show. That, that's going to be an excellent match. And it will be another in a long line of great title defenses that we have seen from MJF this year. So even though I feel, especially lately, that MJF as the world champion in this company feels like a secondary character, and he, he, he shouldn't feel that way to me, but that's how he feels. Even so, you look at the body of work that this guy has put together this year since he won the title late last year. And even from that point, if you want to go back to the very end of last year, Winter is Coming, the match with Ricky Starks, that match, the Iron Man match at Revolution with Brian Danielson, the four-way pillars match at Double or Nothing, the Wembley match with Adam Cole, the Grand Slam match with Samoa Joe. This guy's body of work this year, I would put that up against anybody else. Right? And, and Will Ospreay, I think Will Ospreay in the ring bell to bell is the best wrestler in the world today. But the body of work that MJF has put together, I would put that up against anybody. He goes out there and he has excellent matches every single time out. Now he's going to be in there with somebody who is among the most elite that they have on that roster in this company. Jay White, we know what Jay White is. We know how good he is. So there is no way those two are going to go out there at full gear and have anything other than a match of the year candidate. So I am looking forward to that match very much so. Um, and as far as, you know, looking even beyond that, it probably will end up being the final title defense he has this year. Now, they do. Winter is coming in December. So he may defend his championship one more time after that. That's assuming he retains. It's not a guarantee. It's assuming he retains. Because full gear is going to be one year of MJF as the AEW world champion. Who's to say that Jay White doesn't take the title from him and then MJF has to chase to get it back? It's possible. But if MJF retains... He could defend the title one more time at Winter is Coming. And it could very well be against Ricky Starks. One year later. Only this time the roles would be reversed. Now MJF is the babyface and Ricky would be the heel. Because they, they have unresolved issues between those two. They have to run that back at some point. I said it as soon as that match was over. You can't leave it hanging like that. You've got to run this back again. Because the last they left it, there really was no resolution to it so who knows maybe we get that again at winter is coming at the end of the year but he has to hold on to the title first in order for that to happen Renee was backstage with Hook and Orange Cassidy who said that they were very close to winning their match at Wrestle Dream but Hook is still a great champion Hook said that it was Cassidy who should be getting the international title shot next week against Ray Phoenix 
and not John Moxley. And Cassidy said, yeah, but Moxley was champion for about three weeks while I was champion for 11 months. But whatever. And they all stood around very awkwardly eating chips, except Renee, who uh, passed on the chips when they were offered. We had Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho against Kanosuke Takeshita and Kyle Fletcher. Don Callis sat in on commentary here for the match. Tony Schiavone was appalled by the painting that they had on screen of The Last Supper. This time with Don Callis in the paint. It's the same painting we saw at Wrestle Dream. I guess uh, Tony Schiavone wasn't paying attention to the show. He, he acted like this was the first time he had seen this, but we've already seen that before. Uh, this was a big spot for Kyle Fletcher to be in in there up against Jericho and Omega, and he more than held his own in there. Jericho hit the lion salt on Fletcher. He made the hot tag to Kenny. Fletcher uh, did, in fact, escape the you can't escape, but Takeshita, he did get caught. Takeshita got caught. Omega hit the rolling fireman's carry, followed by the corner uh, backstabber on Fletcher. Omega and Takeshita, they were trading shots until Fletcher blindsided Kenny with a snapdragon. Omega fought off a tombstone into a snapdragon. Jericho made the tag, and he hit a top rope Hurricane Rana, took Fletcher all the way down. Fletcher and Jericho, they had a strike battle until both collided on a double clothesline, and that took us into our second commercial break. Jericho had the walls of Jericho locked on Fletcher. It took multiple boots, but Takeshita did break it up. Kenny made the tag, and he... Hit a knee lift, a power bomb, and a charging knee strike to Fletcher that got two. Fletcher tried a Michinoku driver, but Kenny shoved him into a Judas effect, and then he stumbled backwards into the one winged angel, and Kenny Omega picks up the wing. Kenny Omega hasn't won very many matches recently since uh, breaking up with Don Callis, but he picked up a win tonight. Callis got up off commentary. He was screaming about how Fletcher had let him down and screwed him and his family. So as Callis is talking trash from the stage, Jericho and Omega, they're blindsided in the ring by Powerhouse Hobbs, somebody we haven't seen on Dynamite in some time. He laid out Jericho with a spine buster. He threw Omega out of the ring and was put in a pretty vicious beating on him, and then he launched him over the barricade into a bunch of empty chairs. They had cleared the people away, and so Jericho, or uh, Omega rather, landed in all the chairs. Hobbs hopped the barricade to go after him, and he looked over and he grabbed a metal guardrail, and he ripped one of the pieces off the guardrail and threw it down, and he picked up the guardrail and he dropped it on top of Omega's body. Hobbs dragged him back over to the barricade, threw him back to ringside. Takeshita then put Kenny in the ring. Excalibur on commentary to explain, because you would be watching this going, wait a minute, where are the Young Bucks? We just saw them earlier in the show, right? Nick wrestled. Matt was in his corner. Where's Hangman? Where are the Bucks? So they, at least they explained on commentary that after the match earlier, uh, Matt Jackson had gone with his brother to the hospital. They didn't say why, but... That would explain why they're not there. And then he said Hangman Page wasn't there. So at least they took the time to explain why his friends wouldn't come out to save him. Apparently, Edge only pretended to give a crap about Kenny when he met him in that opening segment. Remember, he was so complimentary of Jericho and Omega. To open the show, he shook their hands. Apparently, he didn't care enough to come out and help these two, because we know he was in the back. So Callis and Takeshita, they used duct tape. Or they tried to. They were trying. They were trying to tape Kenny's wrists around the top rub with this duct tape. And uh, whatever dollar store duct tape they bought was not holding very well. Jericho tried to intervene. Takeshita, though, uh, knocked him down. Jericho gets into the ring, though. And like a human shield, he's trying to protect Kenny. He's standing in front of him. And Hobbs takes the chair, a chair. And he jabs Jericho in the gut with it twice. Hobbs was going to hit Jericho with a chair. Callus stopped him. And Callus took the chair instead. And he hit Kenny Omega, just a dead shot, unprotected chair shot right to the skull with the chair. And he dents the chair. 
and he's holding it up so everybody could see the dent in it. And, and the chair, I'll talk about this in a second, but I'm not sure that was, I'm not sure that wasn't a gimmicked chair or made of a, a material other than what the chairs are usually made from. I hope it was. Uh, but he showed off the dent in the chair, and then he raised Hobbs' arm, and they left together. So the duct tape didn't really cooperate. It, it, you know, They were wrapping his wrists, and one of them just easily came off. So I think the tape was barely holding the other wrist. Uh, the chair shot to the head was stupid. It was stupid. It was unnecessary. Maybe it was a gimmick chair. I hope it was. But you had Excalibur on commentary, who's like openly acknowledging, oh, you know, it's basically talking about how you know that that sort of thing used to happen in this business and it's not tolerated anymore and then Taz on commentary is talking about how you know commonplace it was in the old ECW and how he was part of that and it's not something he's proud of right so they'll have the announcers talking about this on TV but then they'll go out and they'll have Don Callis hit this guy in the head with an unprotected chair shot to the head it's like, well, we've explained on commentary that we don't condone it, we don't approve it, but we'll do it anyway. So hopefully it was all gimmicked up, because if not, it's just stupid. It's just dumb. Like, they didn't explain why Sammy Guevara wasn't medically cleared tonight. Sometimes some of these people are just randomly not medically cleared. This happened on Raw Monday night. Damian Priest was supposed to have a match with Jey Uso. It was on the schedule. It was advertised for the show. And then when the show started, we were told, well, Damian Priest is not medically clear. So you're going to hit Kenny Omega in the head with a chair, and then when he gets concussed and he's not medically cleared, it's going to screw up your show next week. Like, it's just stupid. But as far as Hobbs is concerned, so Powerhouse Hobbs is now part of the Don Callis family. Powerhouse Hobbs used to be a member of Team Taz. And he went from Team Taz to QT Marshall's crew. And then he went from QT Marshall's crew now to the Don Callis family. So this guy has had more groups than a camp counselor. He's bounced around so many times now. This group didn't work out quite well, so he went here. The QT thing was never going to work out. Now he's part of this group. And for his sake, I hope this time it sticks. But I said this on Twitter. I said he's still a relatively young guy. He's 32 years old, right? built, right, this massive guy compared to a lot of other people you see on this roster. He comes out there, he's like a monster, he's mowing people down. They call him Powerhouse, Powerhouse Hobbs. It's in the guy's name. He's talented. But the key with him is consistency. We will see him on television, and then we won't for weeks at a time. So if he's going to be part of Callis' crew, that's a good thing, because Don Callis's crew, Callis gets television time every week. Don Callis gets more television time than Hobbs and Miro and Andrade and, and, and Keith Lee and so many of the actual in-ring talents on this show. So that's a positive because it should get him on television more often, right? The Callis family is, is obviously one of the top heel factions in the entire company. But the key with him is consistency. If he is not on television, if we don't see him, then he can't get over. You forget about him. There's so many people on this roster, and they're always constantly bringing new talent in. All the other talent that gets kind of lost in the shuffle, you end up not seeing them for weeks at a time. So the key with him is going to be consistency. You've got to have him on television every week and build him up, and, and hopefully this time, third time's a charm. Because every time I feel like they try something new with Hobbs, I say the same thing. Oh, I hope this time he gets over. I hope this time, you know, they know what to do with him. And then it's on to the next idea because clearly they don't. If they did, they wouldn't have to constantly hit the reset button with him and try new things. But it doesn't make any sense. Why, why is it not working? The talent is there. He's a big guy who goes out there and smashes people. It shouldn't be this hard to find something for him to do to get him over with the crowd, either as a heel or a babyface, either way. So I see this as a positive move, but just throwing him in there, and let's say if he ends up being kind of in the background and playing second fiddle to the other members of the group, when this group eventually dissolves, and it will, as most factions do, 
what do you do with Hobbs? You move him into a fourth group? Maybe he should join the elite. Then you'll know he'll get pushed. Maybe that's what he needs to do. Let's put Hobbs in the elite, and then we'll know he'll actually get a sustained push on this show. I hope this time it works out. Renee was backstage. She was in the trainer's room with MJF. And she asked him how he's feeling. The acclaimed come into the room from behind. We see Max Caster. And he sneaks up behind MJF. And while he's speaking, Caster begins to massage MJF's shoulders. And once MJF realizes what's going on, he snaps. And he immediately leaps to his feet. And, you know, he accuses him of sending him creepy messages on Twitter. There was a comment. Oh, God, what was it? It was yesterday on Instagram. MJF posted something. He said he was like, uh, oh, God, did he say he was dripping in gold? I don't remember exactly what the comment was. But then Castor goes into his comments and says, uh, you're going to be dripping with something. Like, he's constantly posting these creepy comments because uh, they have like a little, like a funny thing going on there. So now it's spilled over onto television. And MJF accuses him of stalking him and just being a complete creep, creepy guy. So, Caster leaves. Caster wanted a scissor with him. MJF, he wouldn't have any part of it. So, after he leaves, MJF says, all right, I've had enough. I, I'm calling Adam. He pulls out his phone, and he starts to dial Adam Cole, and it rings, and it rings, and it rings, and then eventually it goes to a generic voicemail message, and MJF looks all dejected, which just goes to the point that I made earlier, that Something's a little suspect here about this Adam Cole stuff. I'm not sure things are exactly as they seem. We got a Samoa Joe vignette, though. I like this. This was very good. It showed Samoa Joe. He was sitting like in a lounge chair. He was smoking a stogie. He had a drink in his hand. And he talked about knowing when to be hungry and when to be satisfied. He said that to be a champion, he has to regain his hunger. He said he's focused and ready and should be the AEW world champion right now. But, oh, he's wearing a suit too, by the way. But he said he gained respect from MJF in their last match. But he said that MJF will soon learn that when he's hungry, he always manages to eat. So this put a smile on my face because I thought it was one and done with Joe. And it looks like that may not be the case. They may circle back around to it. But whether he's wrestling MJF or not, I just want Joe in the mix. When when Edge was at the scrum the other day, and I, I mentioned he was so excited, right? He had this big smile on his face. Samoa Joe is like the first name he mentioned. He goes, I've never been in the ring before with Samoa Joe. Which is crazy to think about after all these years. There's never been anything between them, but it makes sense because they didn't work in the same company for so long. And then he was retired for nine years, so they, they missed each other. And then when he came back, Joe ended up getting fired because that company didn't know what the hell they were doing, so they fired Joe twice. So we never got to see it, but there's a match right there. Adam Copeland against Samoa Joe. So as long as Joe stays in the mix and doesn't just go back to Ring of Honor and he stays exclusive to Ring of Honor, as long as he's involved in something, uh, I'm happy. Because I thought, I thought Joe, you know, he's, he's been healthy. And his promo work certainly is, is still top-notch. And so he should have something to do on television. Doesn't have to be for the world title. We had timeless Tony Storm against Sky Blue. Tony Storm in the midst of her psychotic break. She got her movie star entrance in black and white to her new old-timey music. And her lipstick was all smeared. She's out there looking like Chelsea Green back in her Laurel Van Ness days from Impact. Tony was throwing her around. She gave her a hip attack that knocked Sky Blue from the apron to the floor. And then Tony looked into the camera and she told us to pay attention to these very important sponsors. So she actually pitched it to the picture in Picture Break. Is there anything this woman can't do? After the break, she slipped through Skyfall and had a sit out choke slam or hit a sit out choke slam bomb for two. Then Tony ate a thrust kick. Uh, but she came back with a snap German, and she was ready for her close-up. They even gave her a zoom-in, and she hit Sweet Cheek music in the corner, and then Storm Zero for the win. I'm enjoying the Tony Storm stuff. 
I mean, it's again, I don't know how long she's going to be able to carry this on for, but I am entertained. I I am sports entertained by what she is doing right now. The show closed with Tony Schiavone in the ring to interview the rated R superstar who really doesn't do anything rated R anymore. Actually, his partner, his ex-partner was more rated R tonight than he was. But he has the rights to the name, so he's going to use it. By God, he's going to use it. The rated R superstar, Adam Copeland. This was his Dynamite debut. And of course, he gets the big ovation. And he tells Tony Schiavone that your voice was the voice of my childhood. But then he took the mic away from him and told him to hit the bricks. So we got Adam Chance. I thought Roderick Strong was back in the building. He said that in 2011, he was told that he can never do this again. But here we are in 2023, and he is standing in an AEW ring. He said there's a few reasons why he's here. And he one of those reasons is he thinks that the AEW World Heavyweight Championship would look good around his waist. But he mentioned there being a whole roster of names for him to work with. So, of course, after what I just said, what he said at the scrum the other day, he didn't mention Samoa Joe. But he listed off a bunch of names, a bunch of people that he has never been in the ring with. These are potential first-time matches for him. He mentioned John Moxley. He mentioned Kenny Omega. He mentioned Miro. He mentioned Powerhouse Hobbs, Jay White, Juice Robinson. He said those are all amazing reasons to be here, to challenge himself 31 years into his career. And he's already said this before. He said this will be the last time he says it. The main reason he decided to come to AEW is because he sat down with his two girls and he asked them, Lyric, Ruby, what should dad do? Should I retire? But then Lyric, nine years old, said, you should go and have fun with Uncle Jay. Uncle Jay, of course, being Christian Cage. So right now, he said, I would like to call out Christian Cage so I can tell him the real reason that I'm here. So Christian's music hits. He comes down to the ring by himself. He's got the TNT title over his shoulder. And again, just like on Sunday, we have Edge and Christian standing in the ring together, but it's in an AEW ring. So it's just bizarre. Just It's a bizarre sight to see. Because Christian's been there now for a few years. but And, and not only Christian has been in AEW for a few years, but it never felt like Vince McMahon gave Christian the flowers that he deserved or looked at him as someone who was nearly as important as Edge. And Edge did a lot more in WWE than Christian did. But it's because Vince McMahon never saw Christian on that level, right? So he didn't value, I think, fully value what he brought to the table. So it wasn't shocking that he would leave and go somewhere else, but to see Edge leave and go somewhere else is still is still very surprising to me. So Christian gets into the ring. And Copeland mentions that, look, we've been friends for 40 years. And he's probably wondering why he did what he did at WrestleDream, right? Why did I hit Nick Wayne with the chair? Why did I spear Luchasaurus? You know, why did I do what I did? He said he did it because he sees him out there looking like it, basically like a jerk. But he still loves him. But he saw him standing over Sting. Sting! A guy that Christian, when he was a kid, went to the barbershop to get his hair cut just like Sting. He wanted that flat top look that Sting had. And Edge said that he got the Lex Luger look. And that's what they did when they were kids. But he stood over Sting. That's why he did what he did. And he also knows that Luchasaurus and Nick Wayne are going to drop you like a bad habit once they've sucked all the information out of your brain. And see, that, that was a little weird that he would say that. Because I don't look at that as the story at all. Like, Christian in this case, Christian is the heel. Christian is, and he's a very good heel, too. He's just a slimy little scumbag. He's a manipulator. He's the one using Luchasaurus. He's the one manipulating Nick Wayne into thinking that he needs a father figure, right? You need me. You need a champion. So now Christian has surrounded himself by people that he can use and he can, you know, basically get out of them whatever he needs. And when they've outlived their usefulness, he'll be the one to dump them. So 
I don't know. Hearing Edge put it that way, I'm, I'm going to still call him Edge. I'm sorry. But hearing him put it that way was a little weird because I don't look at that the same way at all. I, I look at it as just the opposite. Christian's the one using that. But he goes, I'm here because it's time for the first time since 2011, for the first time properly in 20 years, I'm here and it's time for you and I to team together again. Team together again and face teams like FTR, like the Young Bucks, to show an entire generation of fans why we are inarguably one of the greatest tag teams of all time. So I am out here, hat in hand, to ask you, let's do it. Let's show everyone what we can do. And the crowd chanted one more time. They wanted to see it. Christian looked around. So Christian put his hand out and Edge handed him the microphone, and then Christian threw his arms wide open, and Edge came in, and the two of them embraced, got the big hug, and then as they're hugging, Christian lifts the microphone up to his mouth, and he tells his best friend Adam to go fuck himself, which they bleeped on TBS, but they already, if you want to see the uncensored version, it's already floating around all over social media. So yes, he did say it. And with that, Christian, serenaded by chant of asshole. Speaking of which, there he is on screen right now. Hey, uh, Rumpelmane, thank you for the super chat. He takes his leave, and he walks back up the aisle. He gets to the stage, and he turns around. He goes, oh, before I go, just a quick reminder, Adam. A reminder about what you'll be up against this Tuesday on Dynamite. And then we hear Luchasaurus' music, and he walks out with Nick Wayne, and we see all three of them standing on stage. Copeland is in the ring, looking at them, and that is how they go off the air. You know, Edge never knew his father. Like, legit, that's a true story. Edge never knew his father growing up, never met him. So, probably has no idea if his father is dead or alive. It's the only reason that uh, Christian wasn't all over this guy. Christian can't really come out and say, oh, your father is dead, because I don't think Edge even knows if his father is dead. So I don't, I don't think that angle really works. Although he could always tweak it and go, uh, did you even have a father? Like, there's, there's still ways that he can incorporate that. Um, so let's, let's take a look at what they did here. They teased the idea of reuniting Edge and Christian as a team. And there are a number of different teams they could face in this company. You could do Edge and Christian against, again, the Young Bucks, against FTR. I'm sure Edge would love to work with FTR. It's, it's basically like he took CM Punk's place, right? He comes out. Now he he's the big ex-WWE name coming into the company with all this fanfare, talking about how excited he is to be there. He's going to be tagging. He's going to be doing trios matches soon with FTR. He basically took Punk's spot. So they tease that, but they could work with the Lucha Bros. I'm sure Tony Khan would love to do Edge and Christian against the Hardys, you know, even though it wouldn't be it wouldn't be anything like what it used to be. Uh, I'm sure Edge and Christian could do a lot more than the Hardys can at this point. So they teased it, but they're not going to give it to you. Now, it's going to happen. Absolutely, it's going to happen at some point. Probably not until later next year. Maybe even 2025. Because I'm sure Edge is signed for at least two years, maybe three. I can't imagine Tony Khan brought him in for less than two years. So they teased it, but they didn't give it to you. Uh, but there's so much history there. right? There's 40 years of friendship. There's all the years they spent together in WWE. There's, there's just a wealth of history now that Tony Khan can draw from. That he knows all of the fans. I mean, they're, they're well aware of the history of, of Edge and Christian. And eventually the two of them will team, but they don't have to rush into it. We're going to get an Edge and Christian match uh, before we get a tag team match with them together as partners. The plan is, I'm sure, to build to a TNT title match between Edge and Christian. And the only question is, when do you do it? They're having a number one contenders match on Dynamite next week for the TNT title with Danielson and Swerve. My guess is the winner of that match will get Christian at full gear. So... They're going to hold off on it as long as they can. I don't think they need to do Edge and Christian at least until Revolution. Right? March. That's a big match. And they'll probably end up even putting the TNT title on Edge. 
what I like about it is it's a way to finally get the TNT title elevated. Because you could argue on the one hand, if you're not a fan of Edge being involved and leapfrogging all the other younger talents they have in the company for a title shot, the fact is, if you do an Edge and Christian TNT title match, I mean, that's that's one of the biggest TNT title matches that you can do. It's a marquee match. It has marquee value. And it helps elevate the TNT title back to a level that it hasn't been at in a very long time. So I love the idea. I, I would love to see the match, but it can't happen for a while, right? you got to make people want that match. Edge just got here. Right? He's got to rack up some wins. He's got to establish himself on this roster. Take your time. Don't just give the match away. So that's what I got out of what they did uh, here in this segment. But to listen to Edge over the last few days, uh, and he's done a lot of interviews too. He did interviews with CBS Sports and with Sports Illustrated. You see the enthusiasm on his face. Just go back and watch that scrum video. Like He can't stop smiling. He's talking about shooting that video with Darby, the one that aired right before he came out on Sunday. You know, they're, they're filming it in the, the sketchy part of town in Seattle. And yeah, I know he made the comment about how he felt free. And a lot of the WWE fans were like personally offended by this. What do you mean free? Like, I understood what he meant when he said that. He compared it to the same feeling he had when he was working Indies as Sexton Hardcastle before he got into WWE. Because he's only known one way for so long. He's been a part of the machine. He's been a part of the system there. Now, for the first time in all these years, he's free. He's out of that system. And he is feeling something that he hasn't been able to feel in a very long time. He said nothing negative about WWE. He was very honest, I thought, in a lot of these interviews. And he talked about how both sides just could not come up with the what's next. He was there for so long, he did everything there is to do. There were very few people left on that roster that he hadn't worked with. There were a few, but a lot of the key players, he worked with them. We already saw him in the ring with them, whether it was Roman Reigns or whether uh, you know, it was Randy Orton or whether it was Finn Balor or Damian Priest or Sheamus or any of these people. And I also feel like in WWE, he had gotten stale. That's why a lot of his more recent stuff, I didn't find it particularly exciting. Even the Hell in a Cell match he had at WrestleMania with Finn Balor, I mean, I didn't think it was any great shakes. I didn't think it was as good as the Hell in a Cell match he had with Seth Rollins in Saudi Arabia. Right? He had a three ma- that great three-match series with Rollins. So I think, I, the way I liken it, it's almost like a sports player who plays for one team for their entire career. They play for one team in one city for so long. Sometimes you leave, you go somewhere else, a change of scenery can make a world of difference. And for somebody like him who's been doing this for 31 years, to look and and be as excited as he is to start a new chapter and work with all these new faces, I think it's a very cool thing. And I, I again, I cannot understand why there would be people who would be upset about it. You know, he even said there's nobody in WWE, nobody of any note who's angry about it. He's been getting text messages from management and talent and production people, and they're all very happy for it. Uh, it just was time to, to separate and to go somewhere else. And so now he has a whole new sandbox to play in with all these different people he's never worked with before. And people that he has, but hasn't worked with in forever, like Christian. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do here. He's going to be full-time, and it's going to be tough to not, I think, overuse him to where it gets you know, gets to a point where it's like, all right, maybe we're, we're getting to see him a little too much, and they have to pull back a little bit. Uh, but there's so many people for him to work with that you can, I mean, you could fill up his time for the next 18 months and still have people left over. He brings value to Tony Khan. He is a known entity from WWE. He's got a name, even if he can't call himself Edge, right? Everything else about him is the same. The rated R superstar, the music, people know who he is. I want to see what this number is. I'm very curious what number they did for Dynamite tonight because there was a lot of buzz coming out of that Wrestle Dream show. And they were smart. I mean, they did have him in the opening segment, I guess, but 
they waited and saved his interview for the end of the show, which was smart. They didn't put it on in the middle. They waited until the very end. A lot of times on Dynamite, the growth, it goes down. So I want to see if the growth goes up this week. We'll see what edge is going to end up meaning to Tony Khan and meaning to this company uh, when those numbers start to show. But again, he, he brings value in so many other ways to this company. It was, it was a no-brainer. If he wanted to leave and he was a free agent, why would Tony Khan not bring him in? Why not? And all the ways that he could probably help and mentor, you know, younger people on the roster, I think he, he just brings a wealth of knowledge that is just invaluable. So I think it's a, it's a great move. Now, we look ahead. Collision, uh, this Saturday, is starting at 7 o'clock. They almost mentioned it in passing, so I, I feel like I need to mention that here for the people who may not be aware of this. Uh, WWE is having its Fastlane pay-per-view this Saturday. So it's smart. It's a smart move. That's why they're doing it. They're getting the jump on Fastlane. And so the first hour of collision will be unopposed from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. On that show, FTR is defending the tag team titles against Ricky Starks and Big Bill. And timeless Tony Storm is going to be back in action against Kiara Hogan. And then we get to next Tuesday. Next Tuesday is going to be a lot of fun because next Tuesday on USA... You have two hours, and I guarantee you, guarantee you, they'll have a big overrun next Tuesday. You're going to have two plus hours of NXT. John Cena is going to be in the corner of Carmelo Hayes as he wrestles Braun Breaker, and in Braun Breaker's corner will be Paul Heyman. So at least for one night only, Braun Breaker is a Paul Heyman guy. Cody Rhodes is going to be making a major announcement on the show, which I'm, I'm, almost sure is going to be just him announcing the next Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic. Asuka is coming to NXT. I believe... this Is this her first time since she left the brand? I can't remember if she's been back since. But Asuka is going to be wrestling Roxanne Perez. Becky Lynch, I'm sure, will be on the show. She's still the NXT Women's Champion. So they're loading that show up next Tuesday. Why are they doing this? Because AEW is airing Dynamite on Tuesday because Wednesday is the MLB playoffs. So it'll be a Tuesday episode of Dynamite on TBS instead. On that episode of Dynamite, what they announced already, Ray Phoenix is going to defend the international title against John Moxley, and I think that that, to me, smells like a title change. I think the title is going back to John Moxley. Because if you remember, he was not supposed to lose the title at Arthur Ashe. That was an audible that he called because he knew he was hurt. And so Moxley said, look, you're going over. And Phoenix won the championship. That was not the original plan. In fact, it messed up plans they had for Forbidden Door. Or not Forbidden Door. For, for Wrestle Dream. Kind of felt like Forbidden Door a little bit. Where Moxley was going to defend the title against an outsider. Probably Josh Barnett. And he couldn't because he wasn't medically cleared and he wasn't the champion anymore. I think Moxley's probably going to get the belt back. It's kind of similar to what we just saw in NXT with the North American title. You know, the reports came out that Mustafa Ali, before he got fired, was going to win the North American title at No Mercy. Then he got fired. So they put Trick Williams in there, and they did the title change. And then he lost the championship back to Dominic on NXT last night. So I think it may be a similar thing with Moxley next week. Soraya defends the AEW Women's Championship against Hikaru Shida. Chris Jericho, one-on-one -on -one with Powerhouse Hobbs. Switchblade Jay White is going to go one-on-one -on -one with Hangman Adam Page. And Brian Danielson, one-on-one -on -one with Swerve Strickland. The winner becomes number one contender for the TNT Championship. And that is a pretty loaded card. Now the ball's in WWE's court. They're going tit-for-tat here. They have SmackDown on Friday, and they have Raw next Monday. So what I think is going to happen here is they're going to continue to go back and forth, adding more things to these shows. So you're going to have AW with Collision on Saturday. They can announce something else for Dynamite. WWE is going to get the last word because they have Raw next Monday, and they can announce something the night before and say, hey, guess what we just added to the NXT show the next night. So this is what's going to happen over the course of the next week. These shows, I think, are going to get even more loaded up. And it's great for the fans because it's going to be a fun night next week. you got two freaking loaded shows. 
what I'm thinking about doing, and I don't know, I'm going to see if I can juggle this. My my thought is, and I may put it to a vote, we may do a, uh, a Super Tuesday dual review where I'm going to try to watch both shows possibly and maybe review both. I don't know yet. We'll see. But it's going to be a busy night. That's for sure. And I don't have an issue with it. Again, there are people who are upset about this. Oh, look at what, you know, WWE, look what they're doing. They're loading up NXT like it's not fair. Look, remember, Tuesday's their night. Technically, AEW is invading their night. But I don't have a problem with it. It's competition. It's the beauty of competition. This is what it's all about, right? Free market with wrestling. Hey, load them up. I don't have a problem with that. I don't think you should have a problem with it either. I can't for the life of me figure out why people are so upset. I think these people, if they didn't have something to be upset about, they would be upset. That's what I think. I just think they're miserable individuals who are just going to be mad no matter what they do. And I just look at it in a completely different way. I think it's going to be a very newsworthy night, very fun night. Of course, the other thing I forgot to mention, maybe the biggest thing of all, on Dynamite next Tuesday, is the in-ring debut of Adam Copeland, which I mentioned earlier, but I forgot to mention it here. He is wrestling Luchasaurus on that show as well. And that's why WWE has decided also to load up on NXT, because they're trying to counter Edge's in-ring debut for the other company. But again, I have no issue with it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So anyway, that's coming up next week, and uh, we shall see what else gets added to the show. Dynamite tonight, you guys have given this show an 82% positive score, 17% thumbs down. So get those votes in at Solomonster. I thought it was a good episode. I thought it was a good episode. The in-ring action, overall, not great. Although the Omega, the Omega Jericho match was, it was very good. The opening match was a hot match, but again, it was a very angle and I feel like a very angle and talk heavy show more than anything else. But it was good. Hey, Daniel Malcolm. Thank you, man. Thank you for the gifted membership. Yes, you can gift memberships as well if you would like to. To, uh people at random somebody random on the channel like sunny man just received that gifted membership vampira says nxt sucks but i am sticking with AEW. that's cool man nothing wrong with that some people like nxt some people like AEW. some people like vanilla ice cream some people like chocolate each their own all i'm saying is some competition is not a bad thing Competition is never a bad thing. Lady Fire Panda dropping 20 bucks on me. The Elite had Jack Perry attack Punk so Punk could fight back and get fired so that traitor Tony Khan could make room for that traitor Edge. It all makes sense. It was all a setup. You know, we still haven't seen Jack Perry uh, back on the show. When, when is AEW in Chicago next? Usually they're in Chicago around uh, Thanksgiving. Funny enough, Survivor Series is in Chicago this year. But when when is AEW next in Chicago? Is it next month? It should be next month. If I'm them, I'm holding out Jack Perry until that show. Bring him back on that show in Chicago. Probably like a Dynamite episode. That's when I'm bringing back Jack Perry. Chris AXC, fan of wrestling, no tribalism here, but seeing Edge and AEW just feels weird. How would we feel if mean Mark Calloway showed up on Dynamite? It feels wrong. Well, look, it, it would feel weird, but I'm not sure that he would get much value out of him at this stage of his career. <laughs> at least Edge can still wrestle. Uh, Lady Fire Panda, get WWE 12 and play the story mode. It's really good, and you would enjoy the hell out of it. I don't know. I was so frustrated by 2K23 story mode, I quit. I rage quit. 
now. You're telling me the WWE 12 is better than WWE 23? Link Lex, I feel like at this point Chris Statlander is the main women's champion, while Soraya is the secondary champion. Just give Sheeta her belt. What did I say before the Wembley show? Soraya is not a full-time performer. So why are you going to put the title on someone who is only wrestling part-time? And that's what we have seen so far. That's why I would not have put the title on her. They wanted to give her the big moment in Wembley, so that's that's what you end up with. Uh, GMB says, thoughts on a Jade Rhea WrestleMania 40 match? Uh, too soon for that. WrestleMania 41, maybe. Not WrestleMania 40. It's too soon for that. Uh, 27 to 27 says, MJF against Jay giving 2013 Rock Punk vibe. MJF is lame right now. Brian Pacera with the 40 bucks. A good dynamite for my birthday today, turning the big 4-0. Well, how about that? Happy birthday, Bryant. You beat me by two days. Says, just want to send an early birthday gift for you. Oh, that's very kind of you, Brian. I appreciate that. It's my birthday is on Friday, so... You're a couple days early, but... I thank you very much. Tuxedo T. Servo, thank you for the five. Cassidy Grooms, really enjoy your contact. I assume that means contact. I don't wear contact. But I appreciate that. I hope you are enjoying the content. I do my best for you guys. Orhan, uh, what do you think Seth lacks to be on Roman's level? Uh, Well... First of all, a big part of why Roman is at the level he's at is how protected he's been. It's the booking of the Tribal Chief character. Nobody is as protected and booked as strongly as Roman Reigns. Like what CM Punk was told all those years ago, keep Roman strong. They keep Roman very strong. Stronger than Seth, stronger than anybody else on that roster. That's why he feels like a final boss character. You know, Gunther has that same feeling, to be, to be honest with you. He feels the same way. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, Jake Finn. What do you do with Adam Cole against Adam Copeland? What to do with Adam Cole versus Adam Copeland? What do you mean what to do? You do nothing. You put them in the ring together at some point. You have the Battle of the Atoms. That's it. Make a battle over an apple. Uh, Base Beer says, Timeless is an excellent moniker. It is. It really is. Timeless Tony Storm. It just works. Uh, Gary Koshchuk with the three bucks. Wishing you a happy early Canadian Thanksgiving, Sala Monster. Because I will not be able to watch live on Monday. I am thankful Look, everyone, for you, buddy. It's Samoa Bro. All hail Gunthar, he says. And uh, Samoa Bro just came in to join as well. Uh, Gary, thank you. I guess, uh, yeah, I guess it would be, right? Usually, it's is it the second Monday in October that they have Canadian Thanksgiving? Thank you, Gary. Anis says, uh, Whom do you envision in awe of whom Edge will pet? I think he transposed those two letters. I assume that means AEW. I thought you meant awe. I am in awe of the Super Chats. I try to figure out what it means. Who do you envision in AEW who Edge will pass the torch? You know, it's not a matter of passing the torch. That's the thing. Edge is in there full time, man. I mean, he's... Thank you. He's committed as a full-time performer. So, you know, I'd like to see him put some guys over, but he's going to be winning matches too. Right? It, he's got to keep his value. So you can't just bring him in and have everybody beat him. So he's going to win a lot of matches. And then maybe towards the end of his run, it would be cool to see him, you know, putting over someone like a Ricky Starks. Uh, or or it's so hard to say who, who will even be in the mix at that point two years from now. Uh, who, who's going to need the rub at that point from him? But whoever it is, I don't think that happens until much later in his run. And I'm not sure I'm not sure who that's going to be. But right now, he's a full-time guy who's in the mix. He's not here just to pass the torch. 
<clears throat> you know, he's going to be running with the torch himself. You know, he's a full-time part of the roster. Edwin, today is my 23rd birthday. Happy birthday, Edwin. Happy 23rd. Vincent Alejos, John Garcia has an MRI coming up. I hope they play Bree mode. Why should I be the only one who suffers? Mikey Clayman, bigger all-time star, Edge or Jericho? Jericho. Orhan, imagine Paulie Walnuts as a manager. Oh, he would have been great. Paulie? Paulie as a manager? Could have had his own faction called The Family. Dylan Hensley. Today we had a weightlifting class to see where all of the students at the AAPW Academy are at physically. Not to brag, but I had the max bench press record at 265 pounds. At least I got that going for me. Well, that's very cool. Now you're going to have a target on your back, right? Because you came in number one. So now everybody's going to be looking at you like, oh, this guy over here. Got to watch your back. Cutthroat business. Rumple Maine. Really hope they don't fumble the momentum they have built from Copeland's debut and the pay-per-view. Well, that's up to Tony Khan now. He's got to have a plan in place to maximize Copeland in whatever way he can. Try to maximize his investment, because I'm sure he didn't come cheap. Big Talon, 256, with the $20 Super Chat. When Edge mentioned Luchasaurus and Nick Wayne using Christian's knowledge and tossing him aside, I just thought it was a reference to the Judgment Day. Possible the story will go that way, but I don't think so as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe. I, I didn't see the Judgment Day connection there, but I guess that's possible. Funny enough, he was asked about the Judgment Day during his interview, one of the interviews he did this week, and he shot down the story. Well, he didn't specifically address the story, but he effectively shot down the, the, the story that Meltzer had put out at the time that the... Judgment Day split where he was kicked out of the group came about because they were going to take the group in a more uh, paranormal direction that he didn't approve of. And so therefore he has to be removed from the group. So they booted him out. The reason that Edge was kicked out of the Judgment Day had nothing to do with that. The reason that Edge was kicked out of the Judgment Day is because Cody Rhodes and Randy Orton got injured right around the same time. And they needed a baby face. So that's why Edge got booted out of the judgment. So where Meltzer got that from, I have no idea. Uh, Orhan says, why do you rate Rock below Stone Cold and Hogan when he holds the records for highest ratings, live attendance, pay-per-views, and transcended the industry like nobody else? Well, he's transcended the industry, and he's become a big movie star and all that, but... Again, at their peak, I don't know if you could really truly understand it unless you live through it, uh, but at their peak, Hogan and Austin were more important to the company. And Hogan, for example, carried the company. I mean, you know, he was the guy that Vince chose and stole from, from Vern Gagne, but he was the guy, he was the chosen one, that Vince used to take his company national. So you cannot compare the importance of Rock, who did big business, to the importance of Hogan at that time in the history of that company. If Hogan is not available, if Hogan doesn't come along, if Vince doesn't have Hogan, it's very possible that this national expansion does not work. Thank you, Walker. So you cannot undermine the significance of Hulk Hogan. I don't care what you think about the guy. Hogan is always going to be at the top of the list. He's at the top of the mountain. He's just, he's that important. Austin getting over, and Rock got over around the same time, but Austin came first. Austin is another one who, he got hot at a time 
when the company needed somebody to step in and they needed somebody to get hot. And he not only did he get white hot as a baby face, but he got white hot in a way that nobody could have anticipated and helped launch the Attitude Era. Rock then got very popular and it points his popularity rivaled Austin. He was right there with Austin. But again, I, I just, it's weird that I feel like there are people who either were not fans or were not around, were not alive during that period. You just sort of look at things now in the rear view. They're like, well, you look at all the things that Rock has gone on to do and nobody is, is undermining that. But it's hard. It's also a little hard to put into words just how popular and how over and how hot as stars those guys were, including Austin at his peak. I just put them on a pedestal up here because that's where they belong. I'm not saying Rock is not you know, neck and neck. He's like right there with Austin, but it's Rock, it's, it's Hogan and Austin. That's it. It's Hogan, it's Austin, it's Rock. You can put Rock wherever you want to, but for me, it's Hogan and it's Austin. If I had to pick the one-two punch, those are the two. Simple as that. Wapa Tapa, thank you for the seven bucks. Shaquille Oatmeal. Who is the heel of the year and why is it Christian? You answered your own question. Look, Don Callis gets a lot of heat. Dominic Mysterio gets a lot of heat. But Christian is the, uh, he's the heel. He's the heel of the year. Look, right everyone, now. it's Samoa Bro. Hey, Loose Cannon, thank you for the 1999 Samoa Bro. Daniel Malcolm, thank you for the support. Thunder Force. Who do you think is likely to return to wrestling first? Randy Orton, Kyle O'Reilly, or Big E? Uh, Randy Orton. Arabian Night, do you think next week on NXT with Breaker versus Mello? I feel that will be his send-off. Interesting that Heyman is in his corner. Maybe he manages him after Rome. I wouldn't mind that. I mean, Braun Breaker... <laughs> Braun Breaker has done everything he can do in NXT. What, what more is there for him to do? He's just been hanging around there. I feel like it's like extra credit at this point. Whenever they have a spot open for him, shoot him on up to the main roster. If they want to align him with Heyman. I don't think they're going to do that because Heyman is firmly with the bloodline. There is no, there's no Paul Heyman guys anymore. Heyman is with the bloodline. Roman Reigns rescued him from obscurity. And as long as that bloodline story is going and as long as Roman is around, that's what Heyman's going to be laser focused on. But Heyman, you know, managing Braun Breaker, I could get behind that. Uh, HBKC83, do you give Jade a Brock-like run in the Women's Royal Rumble? Yeah, I think the Women's Royal Rumble is a good place to spotlight her. Let her, let her rack up a bunch of eliminations. There are reports that she's going to be in town for Fastlane on Saturday. I see a lot of people errantly reporting that PW Insider said that she's going to be like on the Fastlane show. That's not what Mike Johnson reported. She is supposed to be in town at the show backstage. That does not mean that she will be on the show, but she will be at the show. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin with the 1999. I'm laughing at everyone on Twitter complaining about WWE loading up NXT like, come on, can't we just enjoy what's to come? I don't hate AEW. This is one of our creepy new super chats, by the way. It's very creepy. Uh, he says, I don't hate AEW. I don't hate WWE. I enjoy them both when they do good. I criticize them both when they don't. That's the way it should be. There are a lot of very sick people. I'm, I'm glad that you are not one of them. Face Beerus. Surprised they didn't have a ceremony tonight to honor the groundbreaking success that is Fight Forever. Just kidding. I'd like to see Edge work with Malachi Black or Pac at some point. Shoosh and thank you. Yeah, poor Pac. Injured again. Don't know what his status is. Have no idea when he'll be back. Malachi should be back soon, though. Silver Tower. It's a great Wednesday. A Dynamite review, and I get to 
go back to work tomorrow since the incision from surgery has healed. Well, I hope that you're doing okay. I don't know how serious that was, but I'm glad that you are well enough to be going back to work. Don't don't uh, don't worry me like that. So I hope you're feeling better, Silver Tower. Brian Alex, Cena shows up in AEW, Twitter would crash in anger. Arabian Night 2000. <clears throat> who jumps to AEW next and who jumps to WWE? I can see Owens leaving, working a lot of his friends there. Uh, Ricky Stark seems like the obvious jump to WWE. Kevin Owens is not going anywhere. Kevin Owens just re-signed not that long ago. So I think Kevin Owens is staying where he is. Um, the next jump over to WWE, yeah, I mean, again, I don't know what the contract status is for Ricky Starks, but a guy like Starks, a guy like Hobbs, a guy like Wardlow, you know, the more that Tony Khan tries with them, I I'm talking more now Wardlow and Hobbs, because uh, Starks is doing okay right now, but when the time comes, you know, as they get closer, let's say, to their contract, if, if they're not happy with the position they're in and they feel like, okay, this is just not going to change, and I know Ricky... Is, is one person who's very close with Cody Rhodes. And you know that if somebody were to reach out to Cody and say, hey, give me a reality check on how things are over there, Cody's going to say, hey, man, the grass is greener. Come on over. You know, he's he's he is a very important uh, piece of the puzzle for WWE, I think, when it comes to recruiting, maybe without directly doing it, but just he's so valuable because he's somebody who made that jump and has done very well for himself. So if you check with Cody and Cody says, hey, yeah, things, things are good over here. His his word carries a lot of weight with these people. You know, he was friendly. He was an EVP in the company. So he has these relationships of people on that roster. And I think a Ricky Starks uh, could very well end up in WWE next. But Wardlow is the one I would also keep in. I don't see how anybody can blame Wardlow if he wants to leave. JC says, as a fellow indie commentator, any advice that you got? Yeah, practice, man. Practice, practice, practice. Practice reading, uh, you know, reading as many things as you can. Speak out loud. Listen to your voice. Put the prep in. Put the work in. Make sure you do your research. You know who you're talking about. The backstories. All that stuff is very important. Um... If you've never done it before, you probably won't be very good at it at the beginning. It's just the way it is. But, you know, practice makes perfect. Just put the work in and you'll do just fine. Have fun with it. I always have fun. Whenever I call these shows, especially when I get the chance to call a match with somebody who um, I'm a fan of or I've, I've just seen on television, you know, I'm going to be calling a uh, Suzuki match next week that's pretty cool i've never been able to do that before i'm a little afraid if i get too close to him that you know things may end badly for me so i i, I don't know how close i'll get i'll try to keep my distance but i am looking forward to the show next friday uh jeremy thunderstrikes nxt next week by god it's punk against stone cold Maybe that's their secret weapon. Maybe they'll trot out CM Punk to make his return on NXT next week. Maybe maybe Shawn Michaels was right when he said last week when he, he got that question. He said, oh, we'd love to have Punk in NXT. Yeah, I'll bet. Wapa Tapa, did somebody say Bree Mode? Yeah. Yeah, that would be you. Uh, Loose Cannon. The 1999. Is this Loose Cannon Lopez? Salamonster, happy advanced birthday. Hope all is well. Buy, sell, or rent. American Express, MasterCard, or Visa. LOL, I'm just kidding. Uh, Jack Nicholson, Heath Ledger, or Joaquin Phoenix as the best Joker. Uh, Heath Ledger. Love Nicholson as the Joker, but Heath Ledger, Jack Nicholson, Joaquin Phoenix. In that order. Jeremy says, Tony Khan, Jack Perry is here. Sends out Griff Garrison. And Arabian Night. 
Well, there's a scary, very appropriate super chat for this month. <laughs> uh, my point earlier, Owens told Ariel his deal is up in 2024. I still don't see him. I, I still don't see him. Leave. I still think Owens will end up staying. Although, look, a lot can happen between now and 2024. I, his, is his deal up at the end of the year? Middle of the year? I think if it was up earlier in the year, we would have heard something by now. Like, we've already heard about Drew McIntyre's contract and Sheamus' contract. My guess is Owens is probably signed through most of next year. I just don't see him going anywhere. But I also think his future could be tied in with Sami Zayn and, and maybe... You know, if Sammy's contract is also up and he feels like he wants to go spread his wings somewhere else, as we saw with Edge and Christian, you know, what one friend does, the other one might follow. The other one might want to go too. So never say never, but I just don't see it happening. So thank you for the likes. Uh, the goal tonight was 400 likes. We have officially exceeded 400 likes. And so let us go ahead and be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the Booker. We're going to kick things off here with some men's be the Booker. And we are going to begin tonight's festivities with the former United States champion, Austin Theory. I don't really have a lot to say about Austin Theory's U.S. title run. I think the less said, the better. Uh, but we begin here with Austin Theory against Bandito. I don't know why Bandito, you know, he had the pins removed a while back from his wrist. And uh, I haven't seen him. I'm still waiting for Bandito to pop back up on Dynamite. Bandito and Austin Theory, though, I think that would be a very good match. Not taking anything away from Austin Theory's work. It's just that his, uh, his character is just very bland. Very one-dimensional, very boring. All right, women's be the booker. We begin here with the reigning AEW TBS champion, Chris Statlander. In my opinion, maybe the best, certainly one of the best wrestlers in the United States right now where women's wrestling is concerned. Chris Statlander and Taya Valkyrie. Another very good match. Another very good, solid pick here in Be The Booker. These are solid matches. And on the tag team side, we begin with the North, former Impact Wrestling World Tag Team Champions, Josh Alexander and Ethan Page. A very good tag team. Something about those Canadians. I don't know what it is. I think it's something in the water. Where's Steve? Steve Mello's still with us. He's from Canada. What is with the water supply up there in Canada? I'm surprised you don't wrestle, Steve. How come you don't wrestle? I thought everybody in Canada was a wrestler. The North against London and Kendrick. Paul London and Brian Kendrick, former WWE Tag Team Champions on SmackDown. I recognize those belts anywhere. Those are the old SmackDown tag titles from 2002, right? 2003. Good stuff. Solid matches. I can't say that any of them are main events, but they are all solid mid to upper mid card matches on my card. Steve says, because I'm an artist, that's not an excuse. So is Jerry Lawler. So is Bret Hart. So what? What a cop-out answer. I'm an artist. So are they. Bret Hart's in the Hall of Fame. Jerry Lawler's in the Hall of Fame. What's your excuse? Uh, Rumple Maine. Thoughts on the web and nitty? What? I'm not following you. Rumple Maine. Clue me in, man. Maybe I'm just out to lunch, but clue me in. Noel. 
Mulligan with the $10 Super Chat says, Hi, Solomonster. Listening since 2016. The podcast has been great. Company at work and at home. He is from uh, Cork, Ireland. All the way over from Ireland. Well, no. Is it Noel? I'm, I'm, I'm hope I'm pronouncing it right. Noel. Some, sometimes it's Noel. But uh, I'll say Noel. But thank you. I appreciate that very much. Since 2016. He has been listening to the podcast. And uh, Base Beerus has been a channel member for 10 months. Canadians have them wildfires, though. Incoming smoke soon. Yeah, tell me about it. It looked like it looked like the, the apocalypse here. That one time when we had the wildfires months ago that blew into New York. It looked like a post-apocalyptic world here in New York. Uh, did I see Saw 10? I have not, no. I think the last saw that I saw, the last saw that I saw, the last saw that I saw, I think, was six or seven. I haven't seen any of, like, that movie Spiral that came out, the book of Saw, I think it had Chris Rock in it, and Samuel, was it Samuel L. Jackson and Chris Rock? I didn't see that one either. I'm behind on my Saw movies. Although I saw, I saw that uh, this one was getting some pretty good reviews. Uh, do I think that Jade will keep her AEW theme? No. That's not going to happen. Del Fuego. Let's go Twins. First playoff win after 18 straight losses and first series win since 2002. Just bought me a Kirby Puckett jersey. So pumped. Well, I'm very happy for you. I did see that earlier before the stream, before Dynamite, that the Twins picked up a win. So they may end up being the feel-good story this postseason. List fan says that Saw 10 has the highest reviews ever. Wow. Even more than the original. Well, I might I might have to check that out. See, I feel like now I gotta go back and just rewatch all the old ones. Which is a terrible way to spend your day. If you're gonna watch like all the Saw movies, let's say like binge them. I mean, what a depressing thing. <laughs> I'm gonna have to spread that out. I can't watch them all at once. Uh, Piccolo, yeah, they've been mentioning the Jade Cargill signing. They mentioned her all all on uh, TV this week. They mentioned her on SmackDown. They mentioned it on Raw. They're going to build her up. Again, they're going to give her a big introduction. Uh, Devin from NJ says, What music is Solomonster listening to these days? Uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But uh, I'm always into some good synthwave. Synthwave, uh, Retrowave, some of it you hear at the beginning of some of these streams, in fact. Um, I was listening to, uh, oh God, who was I? I was listening to a, a, a new band earlier, and I just forgot the name. If I think of it, I'll let you know. Dorian Moore with the two bucks. How come we still don't have new tag belts? Good question. I don't have an answer for you. I'm not the guy to be asking. Uh, the Winston Slip, your favorite Edge and Christian five-second pose. The one where Edge uh, put the hillbilly teeth in his mouth and turned around and he, 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 did, the, uh, he did that with his eyes. He went, you know, he, had, he went like that. Forgot what paper. Was that Judgment Day? Might have been Judgment Day 2000 or something. It was like, for some reason, I, I, I don't know. That might have been the show, but. Yeah, that, that would be the way. You know what? That might have been the show, because Judgment Day 2000 was in Louisville. It was in Kentucky. So maybe maybe that was. Maybe that was the paper. How do I remember that? Uh, Jet, I've loved the podcast for years. Keep it up. Thank you for the five, Jet. I appreciate that. I am glad that you have enjoyed the show for so long. And that you keep coming back for more. Bread Hart has been a channel member for 18 years. 18 years. 18 months. <laughs> 18 months. That would be very impressive, seeing as I haven't been doing the podcast for 18 years. Next month will be 16 years. Now, Bread Hart has been a channel member for 18 months. 
Uh, do I have any desire to run my own wrestling promotion one day? Absolutely not. I am content to be a part of a promotion and to contribute in any way I can and be the commissioner and commentary and all that good stuff. Running my own promotion is not my idea of fun. Ronan, Mike Clips, have you ever heard of The Midnight? They are a retro wave band. I would suggest checking them. I have heard of The Midnight. Yes, I have. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if I have some of their songs on my playlist. Congrats on almost 20 years soon, Solo Monster. <laughs> you got me curious now if I actually do have them on my Spotify playlist. I'll check really quick. I'm almost positive I do. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, almost, almost 20 years. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. We have a few more years to go before we hit the 20-year anniversary of the show. Then, then we got to come up with something big to do. I don't know what. Uh, the Midnight. The Midnight. Oh, wait, wait. Midnight. I do, yeah. Yeah, there's a song by The Midnight called uh, Change Your Heart or Die that I like. But there's another one. It's a cover. Uh, the Man Behind the Mask. Yeah, it's a cover. It's by uh, Midnight Danger. Look that up. Midnight Danger with Lizzie Dolls. It's called The Man Behind the Mask. I love that song. It's a great song. Great song, perfect song for Halloween season, too. Love Lie, do you like Olivia Rodrigo? Also, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, I like looking at Olivia Rodrigo. Beyond that, I, I don't really have much to say about her. Uh, Bass Beerus, your thoughts on... The Night of Limo Explosion with Vince. I believe Paul London was corpsing on camera as Vince was leaving the building. I remember that. But beyond that, I, I don't really think I was much a fan of the angle. I thought it was kind of stupid. Oz and Glorious, Macro Blank is gold if you're feeling vaporwave. Happy birthday this week. Thank you. I will check that out. I don't think I've heard of them before. <clears throat> Did he get fired? I don't know if that's what, what got him fired. I, he might have been gone from the company after that. So, yeah, it's possible. Maybe that he got fired from that. It is possible. I could see I could see Vince being a little upset about that. I could see him being a little upset. Uh Base Beerus. Oh, I saw that one already. Almost read that twice. Rumplemane. Again, you know, not really, not really uh, familiar with it. Uh, do I know why Booker T all of a sudden had a an African accent in TNA? Are you talking about Chet Lemon and Black Snow? The greatest announced team since Heenan and Monsoon? Uh, Solid Ice, I've seen the Midnight in concert. I've never seen them in concert before. <laughs> Leon Ruff. Did Leon Ruff, what, what title did Leon Ruff, did, Leon Ruff didn't win a title in NXT. Yeah, no, Black, Black Snow, Black Snow and Chet Lemon, what, one of the, uh, one of the funnier things they ever did in TNA. That, and of course, the paparazzi productions that Kevin Nash did with a lot of the X Division guys. Oh, he won the North American title. Yeah, somebody said Leon Ruff won the NXT title. I said, no, he didn't. 
I must not have been watching NXT when that happened. Uh, has any TV wrestler confronted me at Hog because of something I said about them that was negative? Well, if they did, I wouldn't talk about it. But I'm still standing here, so. Evidently not. And I would like to think that anybody that I may have said something negative about on the show would not take it per as a personal insult. It's a show where I give my opinions about their work and what I see on TV or their character and whatnot. So if they're that full of themselves that they would uh, confront me in person over an opinion I had on the show, then they're more than welcome to do so. Uh, Base Beer says Cena was discovered by Stephanie at Halloween. That's right. It's probably what saved his job. He dressed up as Vanilla Ice. Imagine how different WWE history would have been had he not dressed up as Vanilla Ice for that Halloween episode. Uh, have I seen the new Legends Challenge 64 mod? WWF No Mercy, but 80s WWF. Looks very realistic. I downloaded it. Yeah, I just talked about this the other day. I downloaded it. Um, I did get a couple of tips from somebody. Uh, I just have not been able to try it yet, but I installed it. It loads, and I can't actually like start because the controls. I, I haven't figured out how to actually... like I hit enter on the keyboard. Apparently, it's not configured for the keyboard. I don't have an N64 controller. I have a PS5 controller. So I, I can't actually play it. So the game just sits there, and then eventually it just starts like playing a demo. So if I could ever actually play the thing, I'll let you guys know how it is, but I can't actually control it, so I can't play it. It's kind of like taunting me. It looks really cool, though. It's, it's, it's set up with all the 80s WWF characters, and it has all the music in there. It has animation, obsession with Saturday Night's main event. Like, it has all that stuff. They did a really good job with it, but I just can't actually play it. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, and, and yeah, uh, Power Spying Game says it has commentary in there from old WWF shows to make it more realistic. So in the music folder, if you go into the actual music folder, they have MP3s in there for all the music for all the wrestlers. And they have MP3s and it's tracks of commentary from Ventura and Monsoon and McMahon and I think Bobby Heenan. So, I mean, they did a really good job of, you know, putting all that in there. Yeah, I mean, look, when I do, when, when I would do Sound of Gamer, um, I'm using a PS5 controller via Bluetooth. So if I could get that to work that way with this mod game, uh, where I can use the controller via Bluetooth instead of having to plug it into the USB, which would be annoying, just based on where the ports are, I'd love to do it. I just don't know what I'm doing as far as setting up the controller. Because you got to, like when you load it, you got to go to like the options and then you got to keyboard and you got to like map the control. I don't know what I'm doing. It's, it's, too, it's, it's too complicated. It's too complicated. You got to simplify this for me. Uh, no, I have not seen the trailer for the Thanksgiving horror movie. Is that what it's called? Does it have a name? I, I don't know what you're talking about. But I haven't seen it, no. I was saying, though, you know, we have this big... Tuesday head-to-head uh, -head coming up next week. I forgot to mention that on AMC, because all month they have the horror movies. At the same time, 8 p.m. on Tuesday, they're airing Halloween Resurrection with Busta Rhymes facing Michael Myers. So now I don't know what to do. Should I watch NXT? Should I watch AEW? Or should I watch the worst god-awful Halloween movie ever made? I don't know. Decisions, decisions, decisions. I don't know what to do here. Old man yells at PC. Right. Put my fist in the air. How come this thing won't work? That's me. That's me. We've come a long way, though, from my first uh, PC. My IBM Aptiva in 1994. 
used to play Solitaire and Minesweeper on there. Very cool. Good times. All right, Nick Grosso. I think the guy under the devil mask in the is the end game for MJF's title run. Do you agree? Could be, yeah. I mean, clearly they're building to something. So the question is, what's the end game with this story? It's either going to be Adam Cole if if I'm wrong and he's going to come back a lot sooner than I think. It could end up being him under the mask and then Cole beats MJF. Whoever it is, though, I think you may be right. It could play into his uh, downfall as champion. Dorian Moore, Axe and Smash are DLC for the UPW game. Yeah, the UPW game I'm not familiar with. I've heard about it, but I don't I don't have it. I haven't played it. Uh, Windows 3.1. Yeah, Windows 3.1. That's right. My first version of Windows was Windows 3.1. In fact, there is a website, and I don't know what it is. There's a website that I um, found once that will allow you to, like within your browser, it will allow you to go back to Windows 3.1. So it was it was a trip for me to like go back and it just brought me back to that first PC that we ever got. It's like an emulator within the web browser that lets you go back to like Windows 3.1, Windows 95, Windows 98. I don't know why people would do it, but like I did it and it was just, it was a trip to go back there. I used to have a print shop deluxe. That's how I would do like, Projects for school and print shop deluxe. That was like the big thing back then. Uh, Base Beerus, will we see Blue Cane at Hog? I don't know. You know, he hasn't he hasn't gotten in touch with me, so I don't know. To be determined. If uh, Blue Cane may one day appear in in uh, HRG, we'll see. But I should mention now, uh, Friday night is the next time I'll be live with you. We'll talk about SmackDown. Uh, that will be the go-home show to Fastlane. Of course, I'll be live Saturday night after the WWE pay-per-view. Friday is uh, my birthday, so I'll be celebrating it with you guys here on the channel. Hopefully, you'll keep me company that night so I don't feel lonely on my birthday. And then Fastlane Saturday next week, it'll be Raw. It'll be Dynamite and NXT on Tuesday. I'll decide which... If not both, I'll decide which one I'll be. If I do one live, it'll be AEW. If I think I could swing both, and I hate doing that because I want my focus to be firmly on one show. But if I think I could swing them both, maybe we'll do a double review. Uh, but there will be no SmackDown review next week. Because next Friday is the Hog Show. And of course, next Friday, I believe, is the night that Roman Reigns is coming back to SmackDown. Because of course it is. Naturally. So that's the schedule for next week. Uh, Drew McIncock, buy or sell Rosie versus Trump or the... <laughs> yeah, no comment. No comment. Uh, Devin from NJ, will we ever see the headbangers in Hog? No. Uh, Base Beerus, think Riddle's last appearance was dancing in India? No, he was dancing at JFK Airport, acting like a jackass, apparently. Uh, Oz and Glorious, the site you're looking for is PCJS Machines. Is that the website that I was referring to? It could be. I don't remember the name of it. But go check it out. It's like a time machine. If you used to use Windows back in the day, it's like a time machine. Hopefully, Be the Booker for my birthday will be better than the one from last year. Last year's birthday stream had five buzzers. <clears throat> well, if we hit the goal, if we hit the goal, we'll do Be the Booker. <clears throat> That'd be kind of sad if uh, on my birthday we can't hit the likes goal. I think I may just pack it up at that point. I may have to retire. Drew says the ones from Raw. Yeah, I wasn't sure what you were referring they were both terrible to answer your question they were both terrible
Uh, will Riddle work for Hog? It's possible. Matt Riddle wrestled for Hog. He had at least one match for Hog many years ago. Um, I'm trying to remember who it was that he was in the ring. It might have been Ricochet. Um, but yeah, anything's possible. He is a free agent, so you never know. Any other questions here from you guys? I like this AMA. The Solomonster AMA is fun, but uh, we should probably wind it down here. <laughs> Why no stipulate? Stipulations are, are for special occasions, but there are new features in Be the Booker that I've added that are stipulations or would allow me to then go to the stipulations. We just haven't landed on it yet. They're in there, though. Those are some of the new ones I've added. We just haven't landed on them yet. So they're for, they're for special occasions. Uh, chops from Vader or strikes from... Uh, I'm sorry, chops from Gunther or strikes from Vader. I'll take a I'll take a Gunther chop. Thank you. I don't need to be taking a Vader strike that uh, busts my eardrum. I think I could take a chop to the chest. I am not taking those Vader strikes. Thank you. No. Best tag belts in the business currently. To me, honestly, I, I'm kind of partial to the House of Glory tag team belts. The new belts that we had made up a number of months ago. Actually, they were made up late last year. But uh, I think those are actually very, uh, very cool tag team belts. Uh, do I smoke weed? No. Never have. I smell it all around, though. Here in New York, you smell it on every on every, every block now. Smell it from the house next door. I get plenty of it without having to smoke any of it. Uh, Independence Day or Mars Attacks. I'm an Independence Day guy. Did I like the Rob Zombie Halloween movies? Not really. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Daniel Harris got a cameo in the second one, I believe it was. But, no, I'm not really a fan of those movies. <laughs> Lil, Lil Alien Boy. Whatever happened to Lil Alien Boy? Lil Alien Boy is someone who used to be uh, on the street. He may still be around. We just don't hear from him anymore. Lil Alien Boy, if you if you if you watch this, chime in. Let me know you're still alive. Leave a comment under the video. Uh, T two or Aliens? Oh, T two. T two was a revolutionary movie when it came out. Terminator two, honestly, is one of the greatest movies ever made. Austin says, I miss the belts behind you. Well, that's why they're up behind me, because they're two of the best belts ever made. The big gold belt, too. I wouldn't mind one day getting a big gold belt. See, but the big gold belt, like, some, some of the replicas that they sell, I don't like the way they look. You know what actually looks like it would probably be a pretty cool belt? And I've never, I've never gotten a belt from there or been gifted a belt from there or anything, but they have that Fandu, Fandu belts. Just from the pictures I've seen online, they do really good work. Some of those belts look gorgeous. But um, there, there, there are some versions of the big gold that I just don't like. I, I like the version that looks more like the flare belt from like 86. Like that big gold belt. Not, not, not even really the WWE one. But uh, yeah, so, some of those belts I see from the Fandu um, site are... are Really amazing. I don't know what kind of strap they're on. If it's like stiff, which I don't like. But they do really good work from what I've seen. Yeah, you know, Warhawk says he has a, a Fandu Big Gold. It's awesome. Yeah. I wouldn't mind getting one of those one day. But otherwise, I mean, these two right here. 
these two right here are the best right here. And I have the Intercontinental as well, like a smaller one for a Halloween costume one year. I got like the kids Intercontinental. So that's on a shelf behind my giant pumpkin head here, but you can't see it. It's so old, though, it has the WWF block letter logo. So like that's how far back that one goes as far as like when they start when they started making them is when I got that one. Uh, Noel Mulligan just became a sound off superstar. How about that? All the way from Cork. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Food Hive, I think, is working a lot. That's why we don't hear from Food Hive as often. But he chimes in every now and then. Uh, WWE actually made replicas of the NWA Big Gold Belt. They sold out during Money in the Bank weekend in June. I did see that. I did see that, and it was gone so quickly, I thought they just took them down for some reason. Fandu ones that were probably less expensive than the ones WWE was trying to sell. Yeah, the ones I, like, like the Fandu ones that I saw also, like the big gold, like the old flare big gold ones, like some of them are on like, um, not purple, but it's like they have different colored straps. They have like a maroon strap. Again, like really. Really nice stuff. Where is the Solo Monster belt? Solo Monster belt is in the uh, it's in the next room. Every now and then I'll switch it out and put that one up on the wall. I just don't have I don't have room on the wall to put it up behind me. So, but I promise you one day, one day when I get the hell out of here, and I am able to set my studio up the way that I want it to be, and I can't tell you, believe me, guys, I you have no idea. You have no idea how much I would, I just, I have all these ideas in my head about how it would be set up and everything. But one day when we, when we get out of here, and we move out of this freaking place. Um, you will see the solo monster belt on display somewhere. It will, it will be somewhere. I promise you. Devin says, does the spinner belt make me feel nostalgic? No, it makes me sick. I never liked that belt. Whether it spins or not, I never liked that belt. I think it's ugly as sin. Face Beerus. Still dropping love here, huh? Thank you for the 15. Do you like Carvel ice cream cake? Favorite birthday meal? I used to like Carvel ice cream cake when I was... Still able to have ice cream. I haven't had a Carvel ice cream cake probably in 22 years. It's been a long time. So yes, I used to. And the flying saucers. I used to have those too. I used to be all about that stuff. Favorite birthday meal? I'll be having Chinese food on Friday. That is what I will be having. As I do every week. But I will make sure I have it on my birthday. Solo leaving Brooklyn. Oh, you, first chance I get. First chance I get. I'm the only. I'm the only one left of all like the friends and family that used to be in the area here. I'm the only one left, and they're always ribbing me. How come you're still there? When are you gonna leave? I said, have you seen rates? Have you seen this market? But no, it's uh, yeah. No, first chance I get, I'm I'm gone. I'm out of here. Tessa Blanchard is coming to CMLL. Is that true? She hasn't been doing much of anything. I haven't heard her name mentioned at all, so. It was only a matter of time before she popped up somewhere. Come to Canada? It's too cold. Mm. That's what Base Beerus thinks of Canada. It's too cold in Canada. Plus, then I got to go through the whole process. You can't just move there. You got to go through this whole process. What a pain. What a pain. It would probably take me a year just before I'm even legally allowed to move there.
Power Spy says, I hear New York City is very expensive these, these days. Only these days? When is New York City not expensive? It's not even a matter of expense. It's not even a matter of... If I leave Brooklyn, I'm still going to be in New York. All of New York is expensive. No matter where I go, it's going to be among the most expensive places to live in the country. Like, I'm resigned to that. <laughs> no matter what I do, it's going to be expensive no matter what. It's not even a matter of that. It's not even just a matter of that. Come to Canada, get closer to the, to the wildfire smoke. I'm sure I'm sure it's not that much more unhealthy than uh, the smoke we have here in New York. A shout out to Gonzi, Gonzi from the Philippines is tuning in. What time is it over there in the Philippines right now? Is it midday? Move to Wyoming. You know what's funny about that Mr. Ozone? I actually looked into that. I actually looked cuz I know Bischoff lives in Wyoming. And he's always posting these beautiful, like, magnificent photos of, like, the mountainside. And just, it looks beautiful. But the winters there are just brutal. Absolutely brutal. So that, that doesn't really appeal to me too much. But I, 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 actually, I actually did look into that. I was just curious. Because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like to, to, to live in a place like that, like, you're just surrounded by nature and beauty and creeks and rivers and would be very calming, you know? Uh, does everyone in New York live in an apartment? No. No, plenty of people live out like in the suburbs and Long Island and stuff. <clears throat> it's where most that's where most of my friends end up going out to. So no, not everybody in New York has an apartment. Although there are apartments in New York that are the size of a walk-in closet that you will pay two thousand dollars a month for. Like people will pay that kind of money to have like a one bedroom tiny apartment. You find a lot of that like in Manhattan and stuff. They call them like micro apartments. I, I don't know how people live that way, but some people do. If you live alone, if if you're if you're a single person, if you're a younger person, you don't have a lot of stuff. I guess I can kind of understand it, but I'll, I just I'll never understand how people live like that. Uh, am I a fan of Weekend at Bernie's? Uh, yeah, of course. I saw I saw those movies. Move to Tennessee with Miro. Well, you know why Miro and, and CJ moved there? Because apparently, I, I guess it's a great travel hub. I guess because it's so, like, it's so centralized that it's a convenient travel hub if you're flying from one place to another. I think, I think that's one of the reasons why they moved there. <laughs> Ken says Solid Monster will turn into Bob Ross. Let's paint an almighty mountain there. Yeah. I, I, hey, I'm a big Bob Ross fan. Sometimes it's easy to fall asleep to an episode of Bob Ross. He loves his mountains. Bob Ross has been dead since 1995, but he loved painting those mountains every time. You know what really pissed me off about Bob Ross? And Bob Ross, I mean, I love, I love watching his show. It's very calming, very ASMR, but. He would he would paint something and it looks amazing, right? He did like, these nature scapes and everything, and it looks perfect. Like he doesn't have to do anything else to it. Oh, let's draw a tree right in the middle of it, and then like a giant tree. <laughs> Why did you? What are you doing? You're ruining the painting. Trees and mountains. That's he loves that more than anything else. Him and his trees and mountains. I think they have a YouTube channel. I think. Um, I think it's the Bob Ross YouTube channel, and they they have like a, a live stream going at all times of old episodes. I'm telling you, it's very calming. It's something about his voice, which is just it blows my mind because he was in he was in the military in his younger days, and I think he he might have been like a drill sergeant or I don't remember exactly what what he was or what rank he was or whatever, but he was the guy who was probably going around like yelling at people all the time. So like to go from that to what he was on that show. 
I, I can't like my brain can't can't even reconcile that. But yeah, Bob Bob loved his um his trees and his mountains and re and the thing about Bob Ross, remember, you don't make a mistake. There's no mistakes. This is a good life lesson for all of you. If you're painting or whatever you're doing, you don't make a mistake. It's a happy accident. Perhaps some of you, when your parents conceived you, you might have been a happy accident. See, so you're not a mistake. You're a happy accident. Do I like gyros? No. <laughs> happy clouds. Yep, happy clouds. That's right. Yeah, 20 years. Wow, 20 years. He spent 20 years in the military. I guess all those years in the military and screaming and stuff. I guess after a while it just makes you it just makes you want to just talk very, 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 very low and very calmly. It just I guess it calms you. You want it to be very calm for the rest of his life. There's a Bob Ross movie coming out. There was a Bob Ross uh, uh, Joy of Painting documentary. I saw the documentary they did on, on, on his life and the show. It's a shame what happened there with the ownership of the show. And it was a whole mess what happened there. The people who basically like uh, effectively stole his name and likeness. And his son fought for it to get it back. It was a whole mess. It's sad. It's sad what happened there at the end of his life. Uh, have I ever been to Wildwood, New Jersey? No, I have not. Been to Atlantic City, but not Wildwood. Somebody asked me before if I was in, if I was ever in the Bronx. Yeah, I've been to the Bronx. I, I was, I, I filmed the movie in. Um, Low budget movie, but a movie in uh, Yonkers. I had a I had a bit part in a political thriller. I don't even know. I don't even remember the name of it. But my cousin was a cinematographer on the movie, and she said, "Do you want to be in my movie?" I said, "Sure." She says, "Do you have a suit?" I said, "Of course." She said, "All right, come to." The, I think it was the um, the mayor's mansion or something. They were going to have access to it on a weekend. So I came in my suit. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just showed up in my suit. And uh, my role was to be a media photographer slash reporter that's uh, part of a press conference that this political figure was giving. So, like, I'm, I have the camera around my neck and I have my notepad. And uh, I think all my speaking parts got cut. But So that was my, that was my day in Yonkers many years ago. I, re I remember that. I wish I could remember what the movie was called, but I have no idea. I should be able to join SAG, though, right? Shouldn't I? You would think I could join SAG. I could get freaking SAG insurance, but probably not. Yeah, Sunny Man says, I think Bob Ross actually said at one point that after the military, he essentially never wanted to raise his voice again. Yeah, I can understand that. Power spying, man. Go to bed. 6 a.m. in London, where he is. I have to wake up at 6 a.m. But it's already 6 a.m. in London, where I can't believe we still have 900 people hanging out with me just shooting the shit here on a... Uh, Early Thursday morning. You guys are awesome. Uh, Snow Dog, yes, the actors are still on strike. Once the actors are back to work, they can start filming season two of The Last of Us. So I look forward to their strike being ended soon. But the writers are already back to work. That's why all the late night shows are back. 
uh, but the actors are still on strike. It's tea time in London, right? Tea and crumpets. Are crumpets a thing? Are they still a thing there? Uh, Skywalker. Dropping in 1999. Who will have the longer sound off tribute when they die? Vince McMahon or Hulk Hogan? I'm not looking forward to putting all that work in. Vince McMahon, my God, I mean, look at the, the figure that he is in the history of the business. I would imagine it would be Vince McMahon. Oh, so there's an actual movie. Okay, so it's a movie called Paint, and Owen Wilson is going to be a Bob Ross lookalike. Interesting. Base beer is do the solo monster mash. I like it. I like it. Snow Dog, that's a very good point. He says, probably Hogan, if I have, it, because of all of his lies. If I read every Hogan lie, then the answer is Hogan. Look, everyone, it's Samoa Bro. Samoa Bro. If I. If I have to read every Hogan lie ever told, it'll be a multi-part sound off. That that will never ever work. <laughs> Deciphering all of his lies would be longer than honoring his career. Oh man. Anyway, I think I should probably head out and let you guys go. Uh, this has been fun. I will uh, thank you for hanging out with me. I hope I answered all of your questions. This random AMA session that we had here at the end of the stream. Uh, again, I will be live with you on Friday night. Very special night. We'll be talking SmackDown. And, uh, of course, episode 829 of the podcast on Sunday, Fast Lane Saturday. So... A lot of content coming up. I hope you will listen. I hope you will tune in for all of it. Until then, be well. Stay safe. I think I'm going to go uh, watch some Joy of Painting. Bob Ross has his own dedicated channel on Pluto TV. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I'm going to go watch some Bob Ross. I'll be out like a light within 5 minutes. 5 minutes at the most. And I will be unconscious. It will be like watching an episode of Raw. I will see you guys on Friday night for the birthday stream. Take care.